it covers a lot of the ground um, of these of these philosophers and tries to compare and contrast them. And uh, I spent a little bit of time reading Schiller's Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man. I didn't get as far as I should because it's a monumental work. But um, uh, it, it, you guys know Schiller. He's the same guy who wrote Ode to Joy that Beethoven made the Ninth Symphony out of. Yes, I yeah. did look that up. And yeah. I also have noticed that he was a doctor. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes. And I thought he had really broad skills. He wrote Ode to Joy for Beethoven's Ninth. And yes. I went and I listened to Ode to Joy all over again. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So it took me a long time to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> so much material. <laughs> right. Did he also write some plays? Did he write any opera or plays or something? Schiller? No? He wrote the poem. Yes. Or, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say he wrote the poem around which Beethoven composed the Ode to Joy, which is a fraction of the Ninth Symphony. Right. And, and he did write plays uh, as well. Um, oh, very good. Um, so, yeah, yeah you, 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 you called that right. His, um, A play he wrote, huh? anyone. You know, his, his aesthetic letters on the aesthetic education of man, is, this, is, the, is it at the opening of this essay that he tells us, 2000 Contra Cont, that Hegel called it, yeah, the finest work in philosophy ever written by an amateur is what Hegel said about letters on the aesthetic education of man. So I, I had to find out why. I'd never read it before, before this last week. But I had to know why is Hegel lauding this with such praise. Uh, and I found the reason. And you can see the reason even in the Wikipedia article about Schiller. You don't even have to get into his work, although I, I did read a little further. If you, if you go to the Wikipedia article on Schiller and go to the section on the aesthetic letters, uh, what you'll find is that he discusses uh, human beings, the moral character of people as being constructed of three parts, the sensuous drive or sinistrib, the formal drive or form trib, and the play drive or spiel trib that resolves the conflict between the other two. In other words, he says we are born with these two faculties that are in conflict with each other, and you have to resolve them through a third, <laughs> through the emergence of a third faculty. Sound familiar? Uh, you can see why Hegel would be all over this, because uh, this is this is uh, the bud, blossom, and fruit, you know, built right in. This is this is this is some version of Begriff and Verstand and Vernunft, and it's it's by a, a poet and a doctor, uh, you know, so. I am looking at the dates on these and uh, the Aesthetic Education of Man in a Series of Letters was first published in 1794, 94, whereas uh, Hegel, uh, the, the Phenomenology of Geist, yes, is, uh, is later, is later, right? Let me, let me get us an actual date, Phenomenology of Geist. I should I, I I should just like know this. It's like one of my favorite works. 1807. So there can be little doubt that Hegel's phenomenology was influenced by Schiller's letters on the aesthetic education of man. I mean, you can just see it in the structure of the what he's describing as the moral character, uh, in what Schiller's describing as the moral character. So I see why it's quoted right at the outset here, right? Uh, because you couldn't get much further from Kant than a poet uh, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a playwright who's, who's all about aesthetics. Uh, they would seem to be in a, an, opposing, an opposing worldview. And that's the one that Hegel has, has seized upon to, to help express his, his challenges with, with Kant. So I missed this when he rewrote it uh, when, when, uh, when Kenneth Smith, you know, started his massive rewrite of this essay into what's, I think, going to end up being a series of essays, possibly a small book uh, by the time Smith's done with it. Uh, so I feel like in Old World Principles, I want to have both versions. I want to keep the original 2000 essay as well as his new expanded version, because there's something to be said for the concision of this 2000 essay and how quickly it, it just drives to the point. So 
I have, I, I, the first sentence, may I speak? Yes, the first sentence Please. on this, uh, where he said Kant and Goethe are the two titans. Is that the guy who gave us the Faustian, um, gave us Faustus, the, 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 is that the guy who, who gave us that? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. yes. Faust. Yes, is it a parable Faust. story with Mesophocles? And that yes. really talks about character. Yes. Yeah, Goethe talks, um, he directly expresses the idea that the spirit of the modern age is about the belief that you can be wholly intellectualized and not be attached to the sensuous things of the world, that you can pick and choose among them rationally, because that's the bargain that Faust makes with Mephistopheles. He says, you know, let me live forever. And, you know, I will, you know, Mephistopheles says, well, only under a condition. And the condition is, can you do this thing that you claim you're all about? And Faust says, of course I can do that. <laughs> this is this is what I'm all about. I could totally be disengaged from the world and, and evaluate it all through through basically noesis, right? That this, the, the Verstant noesis is, is, is the core of what Faust is trying to do to keep the bargain to be allowed to have what he wants from Mephistopheles. But Mephistopheles knows. He knows, right? That is just nobody's going to be able to pull that off. We're human beings. Nobody's going to succeed at that. On a side note, though, when you read the evangelical literature, evangelical commentary that was anti Trump, the thing that said is that the Christians made a Faustian bargain in endorsing Donald Trump. And as time went on, they saw how they were losing. And uh, uh, I think there's this guy at Oral Roberts, Liberty University, who came out and wrote a pretty big long article endorsing just this principle, discussing just this principle. Yes. Yes, a Mephist Mephistophelian bargain. They call it a Faustian bargain, but you know what's funny is most people don't know what Faust's bargain was when they say that. They, they really mean you made a deal with the devil. But, yes. but, but Faust is about a very specific bargain, which is that thing that moderns do where we say, we can organize our whole lives rationally. We don't have to be beholden to tradition or emotion or really anything real, <laughs> you know, yeah. nothing tangible and actual. <laughs> we'll just decide what things mean and decide what the future will be, decide what ethics are. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> so yeah, so it's it's a meaty paragraph. He gets right off the bat, pitting Goethe against Kant, and and you know Goethe is 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 seen in Germany the way that in English Shakespeare is seen. Yes, right. He's he's seen as just one of the great writers of all time and the great writer of that language, the the most the most profound. But but the Germans read into Goethe, and I think accurately, qualities that English speakers often don't read into Shakespeare, even if they should, which is that he's not just being pretty and entertaining. He's, he's also grappling with deep issues of character and ethics and epistemology in, in poetic form in, in Faust. And so does Shakespeare. Uh, but, you know, that's that's Harold Bloom's argument about Shakespeare is that everything that we think was an amazing breakthrough of Freud's about human character and the nature and structure of character was already pretty much stated in Shakespeare. But we're we read it and we don't see it because we're too familiar with it. We don't we don't realize how revolutionary it was, uh, what 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 Shakespeare's doing. So. So there is this tradition, right? Shakespeare, like, like also, um, you know, in modern times, like uh, most of the actors, you know, are, are influenced by, you know, received pronunciation English, like RP English, right? Or the, you know, the mm -hmm. King's English. And a lot of the puns and the rhymes don't work anymore. And some, some of that is, is lost. Um, um, it's interesting if you were to, like, um, like they've, in the last couple of decades, they've, like scholars have, you know, um, done some research and started to like, uh, there have been productions of Shakespeare's works in original pronunciation or I think it was called. Yes. And yeah, like a lot, like a lot more comes through. And it, it sounds actually a little bit like a pirate talking. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Um, I'll, I'll post a link to it. It's, it's kind of interesting. Please do. Anybody who hasn't heard this should totally follow the link and, and check it out. That this this new approach to Shakespeare, where it's being done as close as they can to the pronunciation of the time, it does a couple of things. One is, you know, it's 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 nice to hear how much English has changed just to hear it. But all and and it's nice to hear the rhythms and the rhymes of the language suddenly coming into tune when it's pronounced the way that he used to pronounce it. That's also interesting. But another thing that that some people say is that there's a moment when it sounds like a foreign language at first, right? At first your brain's like, what? That's okay, that's not modern English at all. But once you settle into it, they say it's easier actually to understand what everybody's saying with that pronunciation than if you use the exact same words, but with a modern pronunciation. There's something, something, there's some kind of muddle that goes on in the way that we interpret the language of Shakespeare when we, when we don't do what they're doing now. Uh, and I listened to a bit of it and it's, it's true. At first your, 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 your brain rejects it. Like, well, that's just, well, that's weird. Cool, but weird. But then after a while, it just sort of clicks. Anyway, Shakespeare, Goethe, to pit Kant against Goethe instead of against someone who self-identifies strictly as a philosopher is a it's a very Kenneth Smith thing to do, right? Because who does he pit against Kant here? He, right? He he implies Goethe is again is 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 an alternative to Kant, and then he he pits Hegel, okay, a philosopher. Marx, okay, a philosopher. Kierkegaard, okay, a philosopher. Nietzsche, okay, fair enough, a philosopher. But then Kafka, because mm-hmm. one of the things that Kenneth Smith does is that he breaks the categories. So he's perfectly happy to have Dostoevsky or Kafka or other, you know, writers of fiction or poetry or parables, you know, standing toe to toe with people that we think of as, you know, preeminent philosophers and to say hey, what they're saying is just as incisive, just as insightful and profound as this highly academicized, intellectualized writing over here. Uh, and to Phil's, you know, to, to Phil's interests, you know, Kenneth Smith as an artist is is very interested in in the artists participating in the great conversation and the role that they play. So, well, it seems. Let me, go ahead. Let me raise my hand. <laughs> no, it's you. You're 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 there. Go ahead. No, it, it seems to me that at one time. Uh, before all these disciplines split, they were more unified. Right. When I was at Penn State, I remember my roommate mentioned, and we, we were talking about some of the great people in the past. And he said, very few are really uh, sort of like super in at least two disciplines. And he says Shakespeare is one of them. Because Shakespeare really should be counted not only as a writer, but but a philosopher as well, mm-hmm. uh, because it's wrapped up together. And if you look at that that way, then in a sense, uh, uh, you section it off unjustly because just because at that time, things were much more united. And then later on, it actually became separate disciplines. So that then in a sense, well, you're either gonna fit into this category or that category, uh, that wasn't true. Uh, certainly back in Shakespeare's time, you know, like uh, ph- uh, philosophy, psychology, you know, certainly, and, 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 and of course a writer, you know, like uh, you could subdivide it into many categories. So, yeah. So, that, I mean, I think part of the problem is that we have sectioned off uh, the division so much so that they don't interpenetrate. That's why. That's why I, I'm earlier in a, a different meeting. I mentioned uh, that that even in the modern situation, we should break down the silos by having ambassadors, if not a melting together into disciplinary things, because uh, because it shouldn't be segmented to that degree. Well, yeah. it's it's very much. Um an effect of our modernization of all economic activity and specialization of labor, you know, vis-a-vis our interpretation of, you know, like Adam Smith and like in, and our history of industrialization. Yes. You could argue that that compartmentalization 
uh, aids and abets the hyper rational culture, right? Mm -hmm. Things are what they are, and they're not what they're not. You're curious, Phil. Um, what years were you at Penn State? Uh, eighty-seven through eighty-nine. Oh, okay. Uh, I was at Penn State in um, early seventies. Nice. Not going to college though. <laughs> I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Joseph, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, actually, if maybe Richard or David I could expand on that idea of specialization, leading the link to hyper rationalization. Um, I'm, I see it. I kind of see it, but um, I'm trying to just you know articulate it in my uh, in my head, and I'm kind of struggling uh, because. Yes, I, I guess you could. Your your premise is limited, so therefore you ju you're justifying everything, and that's where kind of you have this limited frame of reference, and therefore your rational thinking is is off. But I don't see where it actually encourages rational thinking. Um, you know, it's the go ahead, Richard. Or it limits imagination, I guess. That's for sure. Right. Like if you don't, if you're just mainly concerned about your particular part in the chain and you don't really step back and kind of look at the whole chain, it's less probable that you're going to challenge, you know, the foundations or the premises of which some of these systems have been built. Like, in, for example, like, you know, something that kind of came to uh, more of a collective consciousness um, in, in the news media, although like the last year has been, you know, there's so much crazy stuff going on, is that our recycling systems are dysfunctional and really they've been designed that way to kind of, it's, it's a type of theater. Um, I mean, except, you know, but even before like, you know, last year, like in like, like, and, and like, um, like they, like they've, um, you know, it's it's sort of like the like the same moment of like you know Exxon or like the cigarette companies where you know they've discovered internal company documentation saying that like or like 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 going back that's you know like those symbols are put on like those containers you know to cause confusion you know even if they can't be accepted into the recycling chain um, and even prior to you know like like more of this really coming to a head last year that like you know we've known that like it's around nine or 10% of the plastics in the U S are actually recycled. Um, but, you know, we've all just kind of been told to kind of do our part, you know, which is, you know, take your stuff and put it in the containers and previous, I guess, before single, single stream recycling, you know, like the, we would sort it or whatever. And like it, we don't really think about whether the whole thing, like in this case has just been kind of a facade. Right. I would, just to put it in Ken Smith language, you know, if myth is the counterpoint to this hyper rational culture, myth, as Ken Smith says, is something that unites and sees the whole. And oh. so compartmentalization, breaking things into their separate parts, atomizing things and thinking that you could actually have a legitimate picture of reality by doing that, whereas we know that it's necessarily wrong to abstract is to err. Um, doing that aids and abets this hyper rational culture, teaching people that, you know, don't worry about what's going on over there. You're in finance, uh, your, your job is to maximize profits and don't worry about the environment. That's a totally different system. That's not your responsibility. So these, this type of compartmentalization just further drives this hyper rationality. And Thank you. Thank you, it also uh, fits perfectly kind of in, you know, the only one thing that's like in our soundbite culture that we take from Ken, from Adam Smith's, like not Ken Smith, out of Adam Smith's writings, like, and we sort of ignore like a whole bunch of other stuff that's meant to temper, like, um, <laughs> temper, like, we, like the invisible hand. It's like, if we, we have this mantra that, if, you know, if every, it's, if everyone acts selfishly kind of individually, right, then, then, then sort of magically through the magic, through the magical markets, then everyone as a whole will benefit. And, you know, it very much also fits into what's touched into the paper. Um, you know, the idea of like uh, false consciousness, kind of the myth of the individual, you know, which is bolstered by Kant's um, ideology, um, you know, versus class consciousness, what Marxist um, 
writers dis uh, describe. Uh, uh, let, let me ad address this issue because... Yeah, go ahead, Phil. In a way, I'm personally involved in it. Let me start off by saying something first and I'll address the main issue. Like philosophy used to be a transdisciplinary thing in which you think about everything as a whole, right? As a matter of fact, when you get a doctorate degree, it's called a doctorate of philosophy, right? Because it still have that as a memory of that ambition. Right now, philosophy has been channeled into <laughs> philosophy itself. So it becomes more of a history of philosophy rather than philosophy a as a whole. That's one of the reasons why I have some trouble with philosophy because it, it would be like studying art history when instead of doing art. So in some sense, so that's one issue, but the main issue I wanna get into is like about segmentation and, and specialization. I mean, I, I've given a lecture about this in art and I'm involved in it. And I, I'm sort of like equivocal in this sense because with the accomplishment of science, what happened it was that it crowded out all the other disciplines have to prove themselves as worthy of even being considered. So therefore, uh, at, by the late 18th century, soon into the 19th century, it became evident that they have to become specialized and defend the borders about what they are and that this is the job they could do uh, best of all. And so therefore you develop this sort of formalism. Now, uh, not that there wasn't a formalism in the Renaissance art, you know, which is sort of about perspective, three dimensional space, but the formalism that eventually evolved, uh, certainly by, by the time it got to cubism, was a kind of flattened out paint painting in which it was more about the painting itself uh, versus representation. Now, this is justified to a certain degree by saying what that does is uh, democratize the surface area. And then you could, in, in a sense, express the sort of inner dimension of existence versus uh, describing the world, which certainly world travel and, and uh, the camera has taken away as a better instantiation or representation of the world. So in that sense, and so by the time you got to, now I'm involved with cubism, so I'm not uh, cementing it. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at my early work, a lot of it came out of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, achieved quite a bit of success. Uh, uh, what happened is that you look into after abstract expressionism, which sort of united this sort of like uh, formalist approach, and then this sort of expressive approach with, with trying to still retain uh, what's called late modernism before it got, got into postmodernism. You have, uh, in a sense, just simply a manifestation of the grid. I mean, I remember what first time I went to, uh, to New York. I was teaching at Kansas at that time. A friend of mine was in New York, I went there. And I swear, I went to so many studios, the, you know, the visit artists were a friend, and every one of them have discovered something new. <laughs> and when I saw all these things, I mean, not everyone, but a, a ma large majority, they've all discovered the grid. <laughs> I'm saying, wow. Is this the zeitgeist? Oh, is this just like, are they just out of their minds, <laughs> right? I mean, every one of the variation of the, I said, wait, wait a minute. Although I believe in the grid as a formal structure, like it can't be so profound as the only thing that there is. And so in a sense that almost began my uh, recovery. As a matter of fact, when I was, when I, in my late form, I was doing these paintings, which I call anti-paintings, which essentially I, I discover a cyclone fence that needed to be this uh, repair. Uh, and I, I took it home, I mean, a small piece because it was a piece of wood stuck in, I thought that was curious. I took it home, I was painting with acrylics at that time and I just threw some paint on it. I dry paint, I soaked it off, I draped it on it. And I said, well, I could do something with this in painting. And what I did was I, I took a big piece, four by six, 
at that time. And then, uh, and then I just sort of did that over and over again until it developed a texture. And what that statement was about was because, you know, in, in the, in the mid 70s, when I was going to graduate school, it was impossible to be a painter. Because if you're a revolutionary, painting is dead. But if you're a painter, then you want to paint. So you're left in a funny position. So I wanted to paint and yet not paint at the same time. Okay, so anti-painting. So what I was doing was asserting the materiality of the material, which in a sense is kind of a reaction to the grid. And, and, and it's sort of like pushing even further back the representation because now painting just asserts itself as a material rather than a representation of a tree or the sun or the sea or whatever it is, okay? So as a matter of fact, when I was teaching at Kansas, which, which was a little bit after I was a graduate, uh, I continued this and I thought, you know, if, if I'm gonna assert the materiality of something, what I should do is uh, do a photographs. So I had a lot of slides of my work and my students work, which is a, a representation. And I took a wall in my studio, which was provided by the university. And uh, I made a grid and I plastered these slides onto the thing to deny the representation, to suit the materiality. So if you want to call me a, at that period, a kind of super Marxist materialist, <laughs> that was it. But it was like, it was like funny. It was then that I, I decided, you know, I'm going to go and try to start doing drawing again. And then, uh, then, then I, I'm doing these things now, and like a lot of people look at it and say, this is not modern art. I said, yeah, it is. And what I had to do in a sense was to go back in civilization and, and in a sense retrieve a kind of more archaic and primitive thing to cement it with, with, with modernism. So that, that's the thing that was pushed to an extreme in which you can no longer deal with anything else without saying, well, this is sort of like mystical realism or whatever it is, you know, without being considered serious as a serious artist. So th there you are. The segmentation leads to a kind of formalism that isolates you in that field. And you're, you're very much in that field and, and, and no other field could enter that because you are the expert, but you're not really a necessary expert in anything else. Right. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, and then- If Mary you look Ann. at my website, you, you see the, the, the anti-painting part. <laughs> right. I Sharon can't Ann. follow Phil's complex uh, <laughs> <laughs> explanation. But what I will say is that in my practice, in my life, specialization impacts the efficiency of the whole. And I think that's what, um, whereas he, Dave, was talking about hyper-rationalization because everybody manages their segment. It's often segment, segmentation, and the well-being of the whole is completely missed. Right. Right. It, it's, it's, it's why there's been the rise of cross-disciplinary studies because of the discovery that there is no system of bureaucratization that segments things in such a way that it does justice to the whole. You end up only doing justice to parts of the whole and then all these other things fall in between the gaps and, and get missed. Yeah. And then the whole pays the price. Yeah. And, and, and in, you know, during my lifetime, it was a revolution of medicine. The, the, the getting people to talk across disciplines within a hospital because in the 40s, 50s and 60s, and even the 70s, it had become so ingrained that everybody has their own area and they work in their own area. And we just assert as an article of faith that nothing could fall between the gaps, that the, that the definitions cover everything. And that if we just address the parts, somehow that also takes care of the whole. This is a very mechanized concept of, of what holes are. Oh, and oh, there's oh, been oh. since then a big reaction against it, going back to the idea that the whole is a real thing and that there's no collection of parts that represents the whole, because by definition, each, each part is cut off in a way. Yeah, I, 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 I want to just say this, this briefly. Yes, I, I do not want to uh, abandon specialization because that's important. The parts are important. But on the other hand, it seems to me the whole is also important to create a unity of understanding. And so therefore, in a sense, even more than the bureaucracy, 
It's really industrialization, right? It's really, it's really Henry Ford put into manifestation in the representation of the world. Which Charlie Chaplin film was it? City Lights, where he's doing getting repetitive stress from. Mo doing, I think it's called Modern Life. Modern, yeah. you know, he's doing the yeah. same movement over and over, and then when he takes his break, he can't stop doing the movement, and he gets in trouble with the cops because he's trying to tighten his nose and his ears and things, and gets arrested and thrown in jail. Uh, you know, this this critique of industrialization is is uh, it's it's we see yeah. it, and yet then we don't change the structures of our organization and power adequately to address the problems with it. Uh, Marianne, you got your hand up, go ahead. So when I was listening to Bill, I was thinking about how um, the abstraction of our art really deals with the um, urban tension and all the feelings of disconnect and loneliness we have. And I thought that one of the bridges for me was cartoons. I felt I found the drawing of cartoons actually brought forth some kind of truth and meaning. And I also think that, that that abstraction was not necessarily happening in a Mexican culture because we have Drago Rivera and um, <clears throat> we, we have people that were closer to the earth that could talk about it. <laughs> and I think about D. Chomps, um, New Descending the Staircase, he actually went into the time dimension. He, he, he was more, he was beyond the grid. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, thank you, Marianne. Yeah, it's true. You, know, you, you grow up around the mural traditions of Latin American art and they do ground you, right? They, they constantly remind you of the debt we have to the, to, the, to the soil, to the plants, to the animals, to the larger picture, to all the other people. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Richard, you got your hand up. Um, yeah, just following on to like, you know, Phil's comment about um, Henry Ford and kind of the, you know, the, the assembly line industrialization. Um, like um, it, like there was a kind of a personal kind of uh, a story of a uh, Holocaust survivor. Um, I listened to um, a few months ago, so I guess this, I'm guessing this was recorded earlier in her life, um, or I can't remember whether it was just like um, you know they recorded it just recently when she was if she, if she was live live or not. But um, she talks about you know leaving you know Europe, you know, and um, and 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 you know our history textbooks, you know, often kind of like. Um, you know, don't really show justice to like, you know, these stories, like, you know, like, you know, Han like, like Hannah Rent, you know, herself, you know, went like kind of, it was many years before she got to America, right, you know, like living as a refugee, um, you know, she, she, you know, she penned a, a well-known essay, like We Refugees, you know, and um, mm -hmm. living in camps and, you know, and whatnot. Um, but like, we think now that it's like, oh yeah, of course everyone wants to come to America, you know, so much success and whatnot. But like, you know, okay, like, well, in, you know, in the thirties, you know, like, you know, Jews were, you know, driven by, you know, an existential threat, you know, um, rightly so. But, you know, the idea of going to America was quite frightening to them because, you know, like, you know, because industrialization had not really fully swept the whole world yet, um, uh, or, or part like 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 they're like like you know like it was viewed like you know like America was the p place of the assembly line and it was kind of you know kind of a scary place like you know just the way I mean like the way you, that you work is is kind of you know because it's kind of, it's broken down just to you know your step it's it's a bit dehumanizing I would think um, and also um, just recently um, just reading like that's um, the word robot um, came from a Czech play and um, comes from like a from Czech language and Slavic language like robota which means like you know forced labor like slave labor which is you know and we see like right now so much of our like our our mod like our, our our current modern economy is like driving further further and towards that and like how people are basically basically you know treated like robots and like and, and then eventually we want to get rid of the people and just have robots you know like you know if you look at like amazon warehouses and whatnot right and like that sort of like kind of just becomes so pervasive everywhere now thank you richard 
So, um, oh, go ahead, Sharon. Well, following up on what Richard said, I really liked the Karl Marx critique and this contra can't. He talked a lot about what um, Richard was just saying about the labor markets. Yes. Carry on. He talked a lot about um, dehumanization of people, the inefficiency of the labor markets as far as the general population was concerned. In fact, this was the easiest one to read. And he talked a lot about the working poor. Yes. So I thought that that critique um, of, of Kenneth Smith by Marx and Kant was very, very good. And he was saying um, that the Kantian standards do doesn't hold because it was just for a bourgeoisie universal universe of civil society. It excluded yes. the common man, the ordinary man, nothing common about him, the ordinary man. And it has to do with labor and the way you earn your living and how you end up and see how you end up looking at society. There's a couple of really potent points in here that are hard for moderns to, to fully accept because of how acculturated we are in the premises of the modern order. One of them is in this, there's, there's this, um, I'll read this one sentence out of, out of the Marx section. Smith says, but Marx saw a profound hypocrisy in modern society. It casts Kantian rhetoric over the universal rights of all human beings, but in actuality, it is not individuals as such who have the right to medical care, education, political representation, legal standing or royalties. But in truth, it is their money that has these rights. Money is the true locus of rights in capitalist order. And so that idea that human beings are, hunt are displaced uh, from any legal standing at all as as having rights, but it's disguised in a way that we can't quite see. We don't quite realize that, you know, we have been dispossessed and alienated. You see that with rulings like the ruling that a corporation is a legal person and that uh, the corporation's money, you know, if they, if they bribe politicians, that counts as free speech. And so, you know, they have a, they have a right because they exist as a legal entity uh, and because they can accumulate sufficient volumes of the money that's required to make things move when everything is reduced to the economy, it, 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 gets, it gets hard to, we, we look at those things and we say, well, that's just a violation, right? Because we, we, we know because of the Declaration of Independence, we know in our hearts, the way that we're programmed, we know that rights reside with people. And yet here's Marx, you know, previous century, well, century before last, who's saying, no, 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 not under modernism. Maybe they should reside with people, but under modernism, it resides with the money. And that's why these rulings that seem so bizarre to us seem actually so natural to the courts that are enacting the rulings. Because the courts, when they analyze the structure of the law, can see what Marx said previously, which is that, yeah, the, the money is what has the rights and the, and the economic entities created to manage the money, therefore, are people. And as for biological people, we're just some sort of resource that gets used to, to help the actual legal people accomplish what they want to accomplish, you know. But this is very much goes to the heart of our, our in-depth discussion last week about, you know, kind of our warped ideas of freedom and that the freedom is basically, it's to the primacy of capital and, the prime, and for capital to exploit where it needs. How yeah, I mean, there's this, there's this interest, it does follow right out of that. And there's, there's this interesting thing that we struggle with, which is this idea that we are, another thing that we know in our hearts, because we're, we're inculcated in this from childhood, is the idea that capitalism is about the free market. And that, that capital, there were no free markets before capitalism. Capitalism invented the free market from evidently ex nihilo, you know, through the, must have just said it like God, right? Let there be, let there be free markets, and there were. But, but in fact, it's not called free marketism; it's called capitalism. And Marx is arguing that it's called capitalism because capital is the locus of rights, and that that's very different from a free market, right? In a free market, anybody could compete, but in a capitalist market, under a Marxist analysis, only those with the most capital can really compete because they have more rights than everybody else. 
They have more power. They, they have bigger muscles to flex and they can be bigger on by orders of magnitude such that the idea that somebody with $1 has a chance to win against somebody with a billion dollars is laughable. But because we sell this idea of the free market and competition and meritocracy, we, we have a hard time accepting the actual legal economic circumstances that we find ourselves in. We keep trying to reframe it in terms of what we were taught when we were little kids, that the, the catechisms, right? We, we, we play the Procrustean bed and, and thereby we erase from our perception what's actually happening to us. And we express it in terms that we can't actually compute with because they don't correspond to our actual circumstances. Uh, Marianne Dunfield and Giotti, go ahead, Marianne. So I have a rant, and forgive me for this, but rant. Amazon <laughs> Amazon has this sphere in Seattle, and it's like really cool, and it's like the tree museum, and it's wonderful. And they're going to build this ice cream cone kind of building in Atlanta, and that's going to be really cool and wonderful. But in the actual plants, they don't have any atriums, they don't have any really beautiful living spaces for the people. And that is part of my rant. And um, I have this tendency sometimes to be kind of the street person who puts things on bulletin boards. And I put the International Declaration of Healthcare Rights on the bulletin board and has been taken off. And I am going to now change that word to the International Declaration of Money Rights. <laughs> And put it back. <laughs> See if they leave it up. <laughs> if it's more acceptable to them. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a there is a curious thing. Um, one of the qualities of modernism that Marx and and some of these other philosophers critiqued is the way that we are more comfortable with resources than we are with people because people have opinions and feelings and they're messy and they're not fully under our control. They won't always do what we want them to do. And so you guys seen the artwork of Thomas Kincaid, is it? Who would draw all these houses and landscapes with these beautiful jewel tone colors. And you can see the warm light coming from inside the house, but there's never ever a human being anywhere in them. And his art sells like crazy. People love this stuff because mm -hmm. of course, there's nothing to challenge them. It's merely something they could have. They could dream of being in that place and having that house. They don't have to think about, well, what if somebody lives there and they disagree with me about something? Uh, you know, that would be that would be horrible. That would be a violation of my modernist right to alienation to be a separate monad. All right, Phil and then Jyoti. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, uh, I'll begin with a sure. brief thing. I'll, I'll switch to my uh, other thing. Just before I came, I, I saw a video on all the rich Chinese uh, moving, uh, not moving, but sending their children to, in a sense, buy a property, property <laughs> in Vancouver. And, and there were many neighbors that, that were complaining that, you know, like now housing prices has gone up so much. In fact, it might be the second or third highest uh, housing market in, in the world. Uh, they said, kind of like what you're saying about these beautiful houses lit up at night because it was automatic, but nobody's ever in them. <laughs> that reminder of what you say, it, it actually it exists. It's not just a work of art, it actually exists. And keep coming in, in Vancouver. Wow. In Vancouver. Uh, the thing I wanted to say though, as a main part that was that I found his, his section on, on Nietzsche the most interesting. Because at first, when, when I was reading it, I felt skittish because it sounded elitist, you know, like <laughs> better thinkers and all that. And, 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 and I must admit that there's a degree of elitism in, in myself as well. But, but I also have like a heart and understand that all people belong in, 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 you know, in the system. So it sounded that way. Toward the end, I sort of realized he was driving a point that even the elitists were excluded from this humanism because they set up these rules and these rules become a substitute for the pronouncement of God <laughs> that you have to follow. And so therefore, even if you are an elitist, the most elite 
thinker in the world, you can no longer think, and you can, all you have to, all you could do is escape from Germany, <laughs> because this sort of ultra formalism mm -hmm. becomes an ultra elitism that excludes even the most elite people, because we don't want human beings making judgment about other human beings. But these laws, which are a substitute for the pronouncement of God, becomes right. the dominant thing. I thought that was very, very uh, deep and profound because it really criticizes the system on a deep level uh, because it criticizes it on the level of the argument they're making and let's take, take down that argument about, yeah, even if you thought that way is not true. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it's potent stuff, isn't it? Yeah. A Jyoti and then Sharon. Um, it just quickly, uh, I joined in late, so maybe I missed a bit of this. Um, I w was wanting um, us or people to uh, give me some input on the, uh, you're right here, the essential um, argument that he was making. Um, and I don't have my text in front of me, so against sure. Kant was that like what was it that led to this was it the breakdown of religion was it the breakdown of like he so morality now is with each human is what he he was you know uh, so what exactly i'm sorry i'm gonna i have to move around a little um so what exactly was the, the the turning point? Was it that morality did not come from the outside as in the church or the leaders? And But now we're recognizing each human to set up their own morality. However, that got turned into something like humans being treated as capital or as resources. So... Can somebody just make that link clear to me? Sure. Oh, you want to take it, Sharon? Oh, you go ahead. You're the expert. I, I have an idea. I, well, well, let me just take a stab at it. I think it's, in the, second, it, it's the second paragraph in this Contra Kant where he says that um, Kant came up with the possibility of moral responsibility and free will from the encroaching menaces against two war fronts, Humean psychology and Newtonian physical determinism. Yes. That's why Kant came up with this categorical imperative and said that morals really come from inside you in order to combat these two movements, where I think Hume says, you know, you can decide what you wanna do and look forward to a certain outcome, if I am paraphrasing that correctly. Yeah, so was, what, what was it about Newtonian physics that uh, changed the worldview? So part of it is that Newtonian physics describes a mechanistic world that doesn't have any room for free will or for ethical decision making. Right. Things just happen because they're subject to natural laws and they always come out the way that they seem to come out. It, it, it seemed to imply a deterministic universe in which it was hard to explain what is the moral role of a human being. If, if we don't have any free will, if we're just billiard balls being bounced around the universe, then how can you punish people for things that weren't within their power, for example? I mean, there is a, there is a, when it's not, when we don't dig deeply enough into it, when we just sort of look at the surface of what science seemed to be saying in the, in the 1700s and 1800s, it, it, it seemed to not leave room for morality and right and wrong anymore. And this was deeply horrifying <laughs> to the people who were concerned about ethics at the time. You know, they're like, well, what does this justify everything? Are we, are we resorting to nihilism? And then the Humean side, was the fear that pragmatism was just going to rule over everything and pragmatism doesn't have any room for morality or, or human agency really either. You're just calculating, you know, what, what, what the outcome should be, what you should do. And so Kant was afraid 
that what was happening was these, these twin waves that were going to result in nihilism in a, in a really inhumane way of structuring human societies. And he wanted to come up with an intellectual basis for human beings to matter and to be moral agents again in the world, despite science and, and despite, you know, human pragmatism. Um, and the, the, the critique that, that Kenneth Smith has here with these five philosophers is he says the problem is Kant was attempting to use the tools of modernism as a bulwark against modernism, and he didn't realize that's what he was doing. He thought he was stopping nihilism, but the way that he was stopping it was using what are ultimately nihilistic tools. He couldn't see the Achilles heel of what he did, but mm -hmm. the way that Kantianism got picked up and spread across Europe jettisoned the ethical parts and kept the intellectualized nihilism of it, much much to Kant's horror, which is then what these five okay. different philosophers are critiquing. They're all saying that's what went wrong with Kant is he didn't see that he left himself open to being co-opted for the very thing that he was trying to stop. So Okay, so it's not just... Um a critique on physics per se, or like, right. you know, physical laws. It's what that led to. Yeah. And it's, and also like, you know, when you say objectification, I, if from the modern point of view, I look at, okay, you know, balls are not the same as human beings. Right. So <laughs> how, right. how can you even make that link? But it, like, any, um, I, I was, was that the right answer, Rick? Was that the right? Was that the 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 the, the reasoning for the anti-Kant movement because of these two? Um, because of these two, the human psychologism and, and Newtonian physical determinism. Yeah, that's the, that's the core argument in this paper. Is that what these critics of Kant have in common? is that they're seeing that Kant tried to stop the creeping nihilism that he saw in those two things, but he did it in a way that actually advanced nihilism. <laughs> and he, he wasn't in a position to be able to see that that was gonna be the outcome. It was the later philosophers who could look at the consequences and go, oh, sweet Jesus, that's, that's hoist on your own petard in a terrible way. You know, Like the man, the man who sets out to make things better and instead makes them worse and comes up with the, with the framework that future nihilists will use to rationalize the things that they want to do. Uh, and, and I would go further, like, um, like, you know, like this enlightenment thinking and David Hume, like kind of comes out, out of the, the reformation and kind of a period of time where the church, I think has been like, um, like its reputation has been tarnished through, you know, like other corruption scandals and whatnot. So I think this is also part of the, the period of time that Kant is in. Um, and also I think like, like another one, one writer, um, this is a book on um, uh, Thomas Moynihan. He's a relatively young, uh, this is when he was doing his PhD at Oxford and turned into a, a, a book published about existential risk. And he's kind of covering a lot of the history of a lot of thinkers. And he put it really interestingly in that like the power of calculus and Newton's laws of motion um, you know, physics and mathematics as conceived at the time, like it allows us to do time travel. It allows us to predict the motion of planetary bodies. Like this is what Rick, you know, was talking about deterministically. Right. And whereas previously like, or, or like, or even like, just like, you know, like if you, if you're seeing like, you know, how fast like an object is going to fall, um, like you don't, you no longer have to do the experiment and then imp and, uh, um, um, and empirically measure it and then come up with curves. I mean, you can, you can predict, you know, as long as whatever your object is, you know, like uh, you're dropping, you know, like um, is, is not gonna be primarily, you know, dominated by, um, by the air, air friction, right? Like you can repeat that experiment in other places and you can predict that. And previous revelation was the domain of the, ch of the church, right? right? And now that had basically been, you know, upended. Yeah, so is, that, go yeah. ahead. You know, I think it's also interesting that like, you know, part of the, this Kantian turn is also kind of like what, within like philosophy and ethics is kind of, it's kind of called the Copernican in turn, like now where it's now like centered around the self. Although, you know, it's interesting, I think like, um, you know, like, um, like compared to Mythos and Logos uh, from Kenneth Smith's writings, like this essay, you can see Kenneth Smith is, you know, um, uh, very much, you know, concerned with like that is full, like that view of the world of the, you know, that we are the self as a center, like, like is, is wholly inact is, is wholly in, uh, um, insufficient. You know, he talks like, and talks about the concerns of and the conflicts of hetero uh, heteron heteronomy. Yes. 
Yeah. Which, yes. yeah, this very much kind of like starts to fall within like, you know, kind of uh, concerns that um, uh, Rene Girard um, and, and, and mediation of the self, like, yeah, it's, it's anyway, but yeah. Thanks, Those Richard. Uh, I see Phil and then David S. have their hands up. So let's start with Phil. Yeah, I, I see it similarly, but it's just slightly different. Uh, yeah, go ahead. It seems to me that Hume was the big problem that Kant was trying to respond to and salvage from. Because science has progressed so much that in a sense, it, it presumed that there was a causal link between events. And Hume pretty much proved that the cause is not in the objects themselves, but in the way we perceive the world and create a kind of narrative structure to put it together. That is really the causation. And so in the old days, we used to you know, talk about the, you know, the sun god carrying the chariot across and uh, that was the cause that we know and which is a kind of human con construct, but nonetheless what it is. And the, the problem that Hume has with, with that kind of causality, it's also invalid, uh, just like physical objects as a causality is coincidental. He, he presumed that that kind of causality has nothing to do with any reason you could see. It has to do with habit and tradition and religion, which means that when it comes right down to it, it has to do with some kind of belief that has nothing to do with how the world actually is. But he didn't give a, a way out. <laughs> he says that that's the problem. Like, the, of course, we all want to know like, what is the cause with what or what. And so I think Kant tried to save the whole day. I mean, he, he, by saying, you know, like, okay, the cause in some way is kind of like Hume says, that, that it is in the way we narrate things, but he wants to tie it to some kind of reasonable outcome. So therefore, it's not just like, you know, oh, well, yeah, I think it's this, I think it's that. That's good enough. Let's just go on and play billiards. You know, I mean, like, he was bothered by that. And the problem is he constructed this thing which removed in some way a formula that was more, it's kind of like the Ten Commandments coming down. There's more important than anybody thinking, you know, like you shall fight. The first command we remember is thou shall have no other law before other causality. I am the cause. So mm -hmm. I think that he's trying to do that. But like I said, what happened was, unfortunately, that created a kind of substitute for divine order of sorts, a rational divine order that in a sense overtook even the high priests. <laughs> like in a sense, you know, like he's like, like what Nietzsche was talking about, like a high priest, because even they are no longer the ruler like the Pharaoh is. <laughs> as long as the Pharaoh is there, like they're just running around following the rules. So I think that's where the problem is. Kant was actually trying to save humanity, but in, 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 in a sense, by saving it with the proviso of like uh, linking it to reason, he created this other problem, you know, which he didn't want to, but nonetheless, it became so. Yeah, the law of unintended consequences, right? Mm -hmm. we, it's the human condition. David S., then Sharon, then Marianne. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I was late. I tried to tune in at the beginning, but my for some reason, the phone didn't get any sound. I don't know if people had trouble on Zoom on their phone. A anyway, uh, was there a question you had posed? Because I was reacting to what people were already saying. What was your posed question? Or it's just open up. So Jody was asking about um, the, you know, what was it that happened with Kant? Was it, was it against these, was, was he responding against Hume and, and Newton? Was he, how did he, how did we get into this trouble with Kantianism? And what right. was he trying to do versus how, where did we end up? Right. So, right. I, and I do sort of agree that, uh, you know, Descartes opened the door and in a certain sense, they say he didn't step through it, but he mm -hmm. opened the door. Everyone had to pass through, and uh, the results of monadists and all kinds of um, extreme 
responses to scholasticism, basically scholastic thinking, which is what Descartes himself does. He reasons his way out of a perfect starting point for philosophy from my, you know, from my Western tilt on things, which is what do I have to really start with if I'm going to start somewhere? And, and he ends up using this reasoning that says, I see there are better things than me in my mind. And so there must be a perfection. So I must have been caused by something more perfect. This is scholastic reasoning. Where do these principles come from? That he didn't critique. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everyone had something that they weren't doing, which was reflecting on, well, you know, it's easy to knock things over like Hume and come in and slam all the blocks. They fall down. But yes. to build them up, to actually construct the thing. So uh, Hegel, I'm sorry, uh, Kant is coming along with everything knocked down. I agree, like uh, Phil was saying, by Hume. And where's the way, how can you build a foundation with only mm -hmm. logic? Because logic doesn't refer to the physical world. It refers to your reasoning powers. Mm -hmm. And if you take your reasoning powers to the extreme, we've seen angels are dancing on pins and it takes you right. to insane places. So Kant, just as, as someone who stares through a telescope and does this night after night and records what's happening in the stars and can deduce you know, how Kepler's laws and Newton forces apply to the universe and explains. So with that confidence and background in what we perceive being misleading, but knowing how evidence builds the truth, he creates this, you know, enlightenment statue, you know, to the God of uh, reason and mm -hmm. with the boundaries that are the boundaries of reason itself determined by reason, you know, and, and I, I would stand here and defend them against this paper. Because I think <laughs> the, the paper's accusation, I'm fascinated where Kenneth stands, you know, uh, that in a certain sense, my message from the paper was, uh, and it was sort of said already, well, look where Kant led us to. Well, mm -hmm. look where E equals MC squared led us to. And yeah. we point the finger at Einstein for the bomb or yeah. for the abuse of his knowledge and where he pointed the possibilities I think that's really, it's a funny tone in the paper that we're saying, don't let people use Kantian morals as a basis because they don't really get it. It's too hard for them. And I agree, there's some truth. It's too hard for them. It's not a moral system. It's a metaphysics of morals. It's a lesson about what your morals have to signify to you. That's all it is. And, you know, and it's, fortunately, it actually gives you a concrete negative test that are you failing? Here's a test. It doesn't help you build the positive. I don't know his, you know, positive ethics from his critique or Grundlegun, you know, but, uh, you know, and some of his efforts, perpetual peace, are a little nutsy in themselves, but his moral metaphysics is like exquisite. So that, that I would sort of say, uh, how can we attack that legitimately? Because people have gone astray, you know? I don't know. Well, you know, this is part of the role of the paper Part of the role of the paper is for Kenneth Smith to argue, you know, what his position is. But but Kenneth Smith's approach to philosophy is different from a lot of other philosophers. He's he's only sometimes telling you what he thinks. A lot of the time, what he's trying to do is pit philosophers against each other, so that we can understand their positions based on what they were arguing about. And so that's what he's doing here when he's saying, okay, well, here's an introduction to Kant and how he got started and the initial impact, but he turns almost immediately to what did these other five thinkers have to say about Kant in order right. to kind of get some different perspectives on the, on the issue. So that's kind of the, the core thing that this paper is trying to do is, is give us you know, six perspectives, Kant and five other philosophers all arguing about Kant, if you will, or, or or Kantianism, and and it's it's by no means trying to be trying to settle the issue. Uh, the rewrite that he's doing now goes into a lot more detail about Smith's own position, but we don't have that paper yet. He only he's only part way through it, so we're we're looking at this one. Well, I think the framing of Hegel as categorizing ultimate goodness as an ultimate evil is a little out of a context. You know, uh, it's sort of like a polemic that I don't think. Necessarily ultimate, are you citing something in the paper? Hegel, ultimate goodness, ultimate evil? I don't remember that. I believe he did quote that part, yes, uh, like page three or four or something, uh, which is sort of out of the uh, Hegelian. Oh, there it is. I see it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that puts in context where that 
you know, ideas coming from, but it, you know. So let's, let's uh, put a pin in that. We've got a number of people with their hands up, but I've, I've got this highlighted so we can come back to this passage afterwards and explore it together. Um, oh, the list has gotten longer. I believe it is Sharon, Marianne, Jyoti, Phil, and Fred. <laughs> so let's, let's start with Sharon. Well, I just wanted to say, to, to follow up on what uh, the last speaker, I think it's David, just said, I kind of like uh, the, the last paragraph in uh, Kenneth Smith's critique using Hegel's, Hegel's philosophy. Uh, it said, in real life and over the course of actual history, the Kantian abstractions play out like a Mobius strip that turns autonomy into heteronomy, self-rule into self-uncertainty, and will into systemic slavishness. And it goes on. But the, practically, the Kantian ethics does have limitations. And the paragraph that she just highlighted, Kantian ethics take to the extreme, and in my profession, it can cause harm. And there are pretty examples of that. There's a time when it's, you have to do your duty, but, you're, but executing your duty sometimes results in a, a situation that causes harm to the individual. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, before I call on Marianne, just to give some context for David S., Sharon works in the medical field. And so she was talking in a, in a previous week about how medicine really tried to embrace Kantian ethics. It's still used actively in their discussions about end of life decisions, about quality of life, all, all these sorts of arguments about what's the right thing to do in terms of medicine. And her observation is that it's a great start it's a great way to get into it and to begin to systematize your thinking, but it, it, it can't actually, it's not complete unto itself because you get all these unresolvable questions when they're expressed strictly in Kantian terms. They need, they need medicine is, has this special power to put us right in, right to, to face directly these life and death issues where they become so concrete and so charged um, that uh, they cast a different light on arguments that otherwise might have seemed complete until you got into that into that tangle. But anyway, that's just some context for what Sharon said. Uh, Marianne, you're next. Um, so Thank you for that, Rick. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> it took me a minute to think about it. Um, so, so when Phil was talking, I really felt that there was a domination kind of ethics, you know, God from above. And I was thinking of the yin and yang and how things flow. And so then when Dave was talking about the moral significance for you, I, I got excited because that's what I've been missing is the sense of integrity that we have to have an elasticity in our thinking. We just can't, can't say this or that. It's gotta be elastic and we have to be able to go to the source within ourselves to know how it feels to us. And then we have to live with ourselves. Otherwise we disassociate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that we, we see that in the in the Nuremberg trials, when we when we read the transcripts of the excuses that people who did terrible things had for how they were just following orders, how they were just trying to be efficient, how they were following the rules and making things systematic, and that they should be praised for systematizing things. And yeah, there were some really uncomfortable things like how many people am I killing, but they tried not to think about that. And they didn't want you to think about it either, because it was outside the frame of the system that they were thinking in terms of. So they, they dissociated themselves emotionally and ethically from the actions that they were doing by expressing it strictly in these formalized, intellectualized, schematized, systematized ways. It's, it's, the, it's the Achilles heel here. It's like, it, it, you know, and, and it takes us back to the, to the Arabic, the, 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 the medieval Arabic critique of classical Greek thinking, which is if you are not tethering your thinking to empirically to reality, you could conclude anything and you could conclude it very persuasively and yet be a hundred percent false. The moment someone actually puts it to the test, they discover, well, that may be valid. It may be logical, but it's just not true. Um, and that, that, that contradiction between the, the valid and the true and between those things and the ethical and what you can live with is, is part of the profundity of the, of the critique. It's like we're using this other, these other excluded things that Kant didn't want to include into it have to be factored in in order for us to be a whole human being. 
Um, I mean, can, I that, thing, can I say one thing on that? Because it's relevant to just that. Well, we got so, so many hands. You know, we gotta we gotta work our way through the through the list before we can go back right. to the quick I'll be, interplay. I'll be so, back. so, uh, Gioti, go ahead. Um. So, the progression of to personal morality taken out from the church or a, a upward, a top-down um, morality. You would think that something like that, you know, coming from like, like in Indian society where it's already like in the present, it's already set for you. Now, if you move down to a personal morality, you would think that that would be more freeing and be more, um, you know, empowering for the individual. So how did it get so freaking screwed up? <laughs> because, you know, like now we have freedom and we're tribal, you know, we, we're, um, we're a tribal community, so we can't live without each other. And you would think that um, we would be more caring and more connected with each other. So I'm still kind of like, okay, how, how did we go from there to here? From, from a state of like, okay, let's cut out the church and the morality that, or church or religion or whatever philosophy you want to put there that's a hierarchical to individual and i mean how did how did we as individuals mess it up so much well you know <laughs> part of the question is did we mess it up as individuals or was it messed up systematically and then we as individuals are trying to somehow take responsibility as individuals for this thing that was a lot bigger than we were the, you know, this massive movement across the entire world as, as, we, as we shift our framework for how we make decisions about ethics or about epistemology or what have you. You know, when in the medieval epoch, you know, you've got received sources for meaning mm -hmm. and, for, and for truth and so forth. And, and that's why the scholasticism that was alluded to earlier could, could have so much play. You could say, well, you're allowed to reason as much as you want as long as you reach the preordained <laughs> conclusion, right? So you can't, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know. In, in, in epistemology, we could see how that was an, a major set of handcuffs to say, well, but what if mm -hmm. the received wisdom is wrong? What if, what if, what if the sun doesn't go around the earth and, and the evidence suggests that that's the case, but we're not allowed to conclude it because we have to reach the preordained conclusion. So you could see how it's an epistemological trap and people would push against it and say, well, I have to break these chains so that I can be free to conclude things that are true, not just things that are approved. The problem is we did the same thing with ethics and said, huh. you know, well, okay, so right, the rights of human beings to not be enslaved, uh, you know, why don't we throw that out too? <laughs> Just because someone says we shouldn't <laughs> enslave people doesn't mean we can't go to Africa and collect all these people and exploit them for, you know, massive amounts of profit. Once, you know, we had this kind of crazed reaction where we said, well, if we can critique whether they're wrong about the sun going around the earth, maybe we can critique whether it's not okay to enslave people or commit genocide, or really I should be free to conclude anything I want to. And if I've got the money and power to make that happen, there is this dissolution from a sort of, you know, if you will, sort of a stagnant authoritarian system into a just openly nakedly might makes right as long as it can you know, make an excuse for itself as long as it, can, as it can systematically express what it's doing in terms of the approved, you know, formalisms. Are and that's that, where. Are you calling that so even. Oh, whoops. No, no, this is a broader no. question than Kantianism. Yeah. So oh. even though um, the mor the top-down morality broke down, we still did not break down might. So far, you know, like might is right kind of thing, like the more resources you have, that person is forming the morality for others. Yeah, in a I mean, way. The, like this, the system like th that you're talking about, the system didn't break down. What do you mean by system? Yeah, the promise was that we could, we could make our decisions together. 
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, yeah. that, that we would decide together what's right and wrong. We would decide together what's true. We'd decide together how we wanted to organize our societies. You see that in the in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. You see it in, you know, the Oration on the Rights of Man. All of these, all of these yeah. kind of great pivotal works of modernism are expressing this idea that if we can cast off the corruption and the hierarchicalism mm -hmm. of the medieval system, it gives us this opportunity to put truth first and and you so, know what, and right and to do the right thing first. But that wasn't actually what happened. Mm -hmm. You got these philosophers trying to make that happen and bring it about, but they weren't dealing with the fact that there was still this might makes right authoritarianism streak that now that it could just sh no longer pretend to be, you know, I can do this because God gave me permission. They could say, well, now oh. I don't need any pretense. I can just do it. I can, I can do it because I said so. Uh, so yeah. the system itself did not break down because of the philosophers. The system of hierarchy did not break down because of the philosophers, but the morality was completely gone for them in terms of whatever they wanted to do. So it wasn't like everybody had, could set their own morality. It was them, the powerful, that could set the morality for, you know, like decide what was morally right or wrong for them. Is, am I getting closer? Yeah, yes. and, and, and you, you can see it in the way that whenever a new system like modernism is emerging from a previous one, it has to tiptoe for a while. There's mm -hmm. like questions it doesn't want to grapple with because they go too close to trampling on the old power systems, you know, privileges. So when mm -hmm. science first emerges, science has to make the devil's bargain that it is not going to address uh, questions of, you know, morality. It's going to leave that to the church. And I there was see. a division of labor. If you didn't want to get burned at the stake, you had to say, well, I'll tell you how to fire your cannon to defeat your neighbor, but I promise uh, not to talk about you know, right and wrong and what human beings should do. And it, it gets science off on a nihilistic footing mm -hmm. if it's taken in isolation from its partner from the time, you know, the partner being the church to say what's right mm -hmm. and wrong and science to say how you actually do the things that you do. So the, the overthrow of the hierarchical systems of relationship for morality and ethics left us in a situation where we had grown up a form of science and, and rationalism that mm -hmm. said that it would be nihilistic in order to avoid getting into trouble with the church that was no longer in charge. What we're seeing is sort of this things that were parts of a whole are huh. left without their partners and mm -hmm. that are trying to carry on with the momentum that they've built over the centuries and yet they were never intended to be complete the way that they were. They either needed to be finished, which would have, mm -hmm. which would have required going back to saying, well, maybe we should talk about ethical questions yeah. as well as, <laughs> as well as, you know, the trajectory of parabolas of, of cannonballs, uh -huh. uh, or maybe we need to find <laughs> another partner who can help us to fill in ethics. But either way, we can't just say, well, we'll just stop with what we have when what okay. we have was only part of the picture. Thank so you so much, Rick. Yeah, that, that, I was trying to figure out the historical trajectory of how these, um, you know, how philosophers develop in, in terms of how um, humanity develops. And you really yeah. helped me on that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jody. And and to David S's point before I call on Phil, just as an as an aside. So this this is we're talking about a larger thing here than Kantianism, because as 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 uh, as it says at the opening of the essay. You know, Kant saw the creeping nihilism that was that was arising from the way that science was was dislocated from the ethical concerns that the church had previously provided and and in fact insisted that it was the sole arbiter of. But once that fell down as a source of authority, we were left with a science that was sort of suggesting a nihilistic me mechanized universe in which there was no room for human agency and morality. And Kant saw that and saw the dangers of it and wanted to step into the breach and fix it. Just like he saw the problems with the, with the Humean psychologism. What if we end up just describing human character like another machine or set of billiard balls then where's the role for human beings to be moral and to strive to do good? And Kant wanted to fix that. And he was right to be concerned. I mean, right, we're still concerned about it today. <laughs> so, so this particular critique is not in a, this, this, this particular thing is not saying that, that Kant got this wrong. Kant, Kant was right to, to focus on this. Uh, so Phil and then Fred and then Stephen, I think. Yeah, I, I have a slightly different opinion. I, I think this yeah, system... I think the system never broke down. I'll begin this by saying, years ago, I had a very 
uh, smart guy who was an anthropologist and we talked and for a while and he says, you see like anthropology is the fundamental discipline. You know, you should come and join me in anthropology. He wanted me to help uh, to become a partner in writing a book and I wasn't interested. So I just talked to him like, that's nonsense. Like he's saying like, this is the basis of human understanding. I said that that's nonsense because I think creativity is the fundamental foundation of human existence. So I just rejected his doorway into what being a human being is. I think in the same way, depends how you enter philosophy. I think, uh, I think there's a hierarchy that's set up. It might be breaking down now, but it was set up and remained that way, that metaphysics is on top, and then epistemology explains it, and then from that, it explains everything else. The funny thing is, Plato, who's considered the father of Western philosophy, spent his most intense time in writing The Republic, mm -hmm. which, be, which is social and political philosophy, right? So why would the person who should be credited as the premier metaphysician be more interested in social and political philosophy? And he later also wrote the laws. And so like, so I think maybe it depends on opinion. And I'm thinking like that itself reflects. And I, I've been listening to a lot of mythology and I've particularly been interested in Egypt and I saw Egyptian <laughs> mythology because it's, there's so much mystery in it and all that. And, uh, and I found that it was constructed in a way for, for domination, mm -hmm. but, it, but in a funny, uh, a benign way, because they believe, you know, first of all, there was creation, and then the, the God cre separated itself from chaos, and, you know, and, 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 and order from chaos, and that remained in, involved in everything. But nonetheless, uh, order of structure was dominant over chaos to a degree and you want to keep it that way. That's why Seth always remained uh, along with Osiris. And what they did was there was an added element that was very, very important, which was magic. There was a goddess of magic and magic was something that connected uh, to human relationships as well as uh, your relationship uh, uh, to the gods and of course to the Pharaoh, to the gods. So in a sense, everybody lived this sort of like life that was ethical in relationship to the whole system. So we used to portray the pyramids as built by slaves and now modern studies uh, know that it was uh, built mostly by devoted people who spend their time, I, I guess, you know, in the non-planting season to go help build the pyramids. They was out of devotion because they got to give the Pharaoh an afterlife. So it was always about control of a political system that was based on domination. The Pharaoh at the top, who's connected to God, in fact, he is a God to be, okay? And so you all have to do, and you have to have this sense of gratitude that this magical relationship existed between you and uh, the cosmos, right? And so Everybody did it peacefully. So it, 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 and along with isolation, Egypt remained a very stable society for a very long time. But that sense of hierarchy of creation, you know, what is the nature of being, <laughs> stemmed down, it existed throughout Western <laughs> philosophy. And I don't think it ever abandoned. So when, when, certainly when the church was being compromised in some sense, not that I'm singing, uh, hymns to the church, but nonetheless, when it's compromised, you don't have the stability, then you have to create something else. And of course, metaphysics being on the top. So therefore, social and political philosophy was not considered, well, as considered an adjunct, okay, and ethics, all that, aesthetics. And so therefore, in a sense, you have a structure that never broke down. That means domination and power was going to remain no matter what the situation is. That's why I believe that it never went away. Okay, it never went away, despite what I said. Now, Plato may be wrong in a whole lot of things, but he did at least pay a lot of attention to social and political philosophy. Uh, 
Rick, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I am muted. Yeah, it's it, you're you're right, Phil. It's it's interesting the the extent to which things that we may we may like to think of ourselves as 100% free agents who decide to do whatever we want to do, fresh, inventing it from nowhere, ex nihilo, and we're just we're just creating ourselves. But what we discover when we look at at, at, at history and philosophy and and in, in you know social relationships over time is what you're saying that there are these deep 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 roots uh, that that go back thousands of years uh, connecting us uh, to movements in the past and and that we really can't understand why we do things the way we do now unless we can also understand why we used to do things the way we used to do things and which things have changed and which haven't and why. That this was actually, I think it's Goethe uh, who said that anyone who can't recount the past 2000 years to themselves is living a drifting life. Uh, they don't really understand what's happening or why and they're not making the difference in the world they think they are. He thought you really needed to be able to follow those roots back in order to see what's changed and what hasn't and why. So it's it's a it's a powerful point, Phil. We could do a whole session just on just on what you said, uh, but but alas, here we are. Uh, try to try to work our way through quickly. But thank you for that. Uh, I believe it's Fred and then Stephen. So go ahead, Fred. Oh, by the way, good to see you again, Fred. Yeah, good to see you. Um, appreciate all the comments. A lot of clarification there. Um, I share Giotti's uh, uh, difficulty in following the thread of the development in the paper. In fact, my hand was raised in response to her original comment about 45 minutes ago about the, uh, <laughs> what he's trying to get at in this paper. This also uh, relates to David's comment uh, which I guess we're in a bookmark and this could serve as a segue to, to follow up on that bookmark about uh, David asserted, I believe that uh, perhaps uh, this paper overstates the case in some of, in case of some philosophers. And that's the primary problem I have with the, the paper besides the fact it's poorly written and there are no, there are no references. So, um, is that it's not clear who's speaking or what the purpose of the thought is. And, and that comments clarified it in some sense in that, that, that I realized that as far as I can tell, this purpose in the writing of paper is to use Kant as a hobby horse for some hidden agenda. And that hidden agenda, as far as I can tell, is some tired old Marxism that says that uh, that that uh, even though Kant may have intended this or that, that whatever he intended was uh, co-opted by the evil few with property to subjugate the poor masses. And I wish that, you know, instead of, and, and he uses Kant as a hobby horse for that. So I wish that instead, if that, was, if that was Smith's point, I wish he would say right out front, despite the lessons of the 20th century that continue down in our experience of Venezuela and North Korea now, I am still a Marxist and this is why. Rather than a roundabout way of, of uh, using Kantianism, using Kant as the precipitator of Kantianism, which in turn uh, propagates rationalism, which in turn is co-opted by a handful of people and then he uses the voice of other philosophers to somehow make his point. It's hard to tell what, whether in the various sections, which I think are great uh, in conception, the various sections that says that Nietzsche said this and Kierkegaard said this and so forth. But it's hard to say, say what in those sections are what Kant thinks, what that particular philosopher thinks, what that particular philosopher thinks that Kant thinks and what the author thinks. So that, for example, in the Kierkegaard section, when he says, but rationalism propagates a false consciousness of specious and easy freedom and vacuous rationality among the great masses of people. Um, pretty sure that was not a, something that you would find in Kierkegaard. Maybe it can be indirectly imputed from some lesson that Kierkegaard tried to convey. I'm you know the quote, sure right? That, pardon? You know the quote he's citing here? 
There's a, there's a, well, he, the he problem, doesn't, he doesn't. There, there are no quotes in it. There are no quotes, there are no references. The crowd is untruth, is a, is a, Kierke, a famous Kierkegaard quote. Um, and when he's alluding to that here, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what he's, what he's referencing. You're right that this is not presented in, in the sense of a formal argument, but he's not trying to say, I conclude the following things about Kant and let me use these five people as mouthpieces to, you know, make my argument. For example, he's not a strict Marxist by any means. Um, you, you, you could have an entertaining time with, with Kenneth Smith talking about all of the flaws of Marxism, no doubt, uh, because uh, you're not going to find him as a, as a Marxist ideologue. But I could see why you would read that um, from, from the paper as it stands. Well, yeah, you might like confusion on my part. And I would assert that the confusion is not necessarily or even primarily on my part. Confusion as a result of the paper, which I take as a kind of an entertaining uh, diatribe that I would expect to see from a well-informed, but perhaps uh, over-emotional uh, person after two or three beers in the tavern. Uh -huh. But not in any sort of paper that I would expect to derive any useful information. So I, I yeah, he often gets accused of being overly emotional. <laughs> That's, it's fair. And he often gets accused of being overly emotional. Hopefully this gets back in some fashion to the uh, observation that, that, uh, that David raised that we had bookmarked. So hopefully we'll yeah. say that, if nothing else. Which we'll come back to. We will come back to. You yeah. might You might prefer the rewrite that he's doing now if what you're looking for if when you picked up this paper, you were hoping to read um, an argument from beginning to end that said, here's what I think and here's how I will defend it, um, that wouldn't be this paper. But it's not because he was trying to do that and was too incoherent to succeed. It's because he was trying to do something very different from that. Uh, the, the successor paper that he's writing now, you know, if you're looking for that sort of paper, you might enjoy that more. Um, yeah. this may, I, wait, may I just, uh, since since my, my name was referenced a couple of times, may I just say one thing? Um, okay. It's actually, it's actually refreshing to see philosophers going beyond just, you know, the philosophy more to the what happens with philosophy, which is what I see, like how the trajectory of human, of the human race uh, is changed by a certain philosophy. I, I found that very refreshing in this paper. I was just trying to make the connections on how he were, you know, just the, the connection on how that happened. But Kenneth right. Smith is going a little bit beyond, beyond that into, um, and that, that's, that's very refreshing to me. Yeah, Thank you. Useful, although he's going, it seems, way beyond it. He gives Kant way too much credit for influencing the world. I mean, I would guess that if you look in the, the copious biographies of, say, uh, world figures, say, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, 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 Bismarck and uh, Hitler and uh, Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln at all, you would be hard pressed to find the slightest notion that they were in any way influenced by Kant or his categorical imperative or even understood or read his uh, critique of practical judgment. And yet it's it's the apparently the, the wellspring of all the awful things about alienation and modernity. It's just kind of weird. And I, I would, um, yeah, so, so it's, he, he definitely, he seems to, to uh, certainly overstate his case in a, in a lot of ways. And, and it, it could- So, so the part where he says part. that biographers from that era would describe a Kant crisis that their subjects went through you know, well, you'd like to see that, you'd like to see citations. Yeah, well, I don't know. His reference is particular to the third volume of an obscure work by Heinrich Heine, who was a poet, okay? And who was a rather, I don't know, 
hyperbolic poet himself in, in talking about ideas. So that's, that's a weak reference, I would, I would claim. So you'd like to see a list of references of different biographers who cited Kant crises? I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any footnotes, period. Well, no, this wasn't written that way. But what, what I'm saying is you would prefer this paper if it included footnotes that listed the things that he's saying occurred, right? Uh, right well, OK, let's just say this is my rationalist bias coming from a scientific sure. background. Uh, I mean, this would this would be laughed at. This paper would be laughed at if it were submitted for publication in any sort of uh, uh, serious journal. I would think, but maybe that's just my bias. But it wasn't, right? Well, that, that's even more that's even more ridiculous because that says, says something about the the, the poor state of uh, of. Uh, of philosophy and humanities in general today that they would actually serious consider, consider this paper seriously. No, I didn't say it was, I said it wasn't. That this was not submitted to a serious oh, journal. Okay, good. Yeah, if, yeah, good. It, if it had been submitted to a serious journal, he would have included footnotes and references like he does in oh, other good, papers. Good. This was just presented to a philosophy club in Dallas and we were just here talking about it for our own pleasure, Great. not Great. as should it be, you know, does it meet the criteria of a, of a thing that it was not submitted to? Uh, yeah, okay, and it's wellspring for conversation. It's been really good. Exactly, that's so the whole I, purpose I of this. That. Yeah, yeah. So, and and just to, just to frame it to make sure that you know what his intentions were with this, you know, his intention really was just to take a tour, just a few pages each of six different philosophers by using their five of their reactions to the sixth one as a basis for you know seeing the differences among them expressed just in a quick nutshell. That's all. It's not an attempt to, which is a great concept. What I'd really like to see is you know. When Hal Halbrook did uh, Mark Twain <laughs> and dressed up and so forth, what I'd really like to see is six philosophers dressed up in period dress, taking the roles of Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, and so forth, <laughs> and each talking where Kant makes his case, and then each yes. of them tear down that case. That's what I'd really like to see. So, oh yeah, point me to the YouTube video of that. <laughs> see. That's the thing that we're just, this is just the slightest taste of that because the way when, when Kenneth Smith used to teach at university, one of the things that he used most often as a teaching tool was they'd pick a subject and the students would call out a, a collection of philosophers. And then he would role play those philosophers arguing with each other about what were, you know, why did they disagree with each other? Why did they see ethics differently or epistemology differently and, and try to, you know, get each one right. So, so this is just a, a little, a little toe in the water of what it would be like if you got these six guys together all talking about what did they think about Kant. Uh, oh, and of course, you know, the, the, the thing that's missing here is we don't get a sixth one where Kant gets to respond. That would, that would, you know, really fill out the role playing here is if Kant got to react to all five of these critiques of himself and say, well, here's why I disagree with Hegel's critique of me. Here's why I disagree with Marx's critique and so forth. But it's, it's well, just, a, just a little bit. Thanks for the clarification. Sure, yeah, no problem. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see the, the next one that he's doing, the rewrite of this, he's really expanding the Kant section, and I think he's going to expand the other sections as well. Typically, for most of the things he writes, there's a sort of a shocking bibliography and massive footnotes. So this one is an exception. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to him about that. So, all right. So uh, I believe Stephen and then Phil, right? Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to raise a protest uh... I think we're, uh, <clears throat> too often I hear, you know, most people are atheists and I find them a little bit glib in projecting Christianity lights, you know. We, we could argue once we had a Christian civilization and it was pushing its moral doctrine, but uh, that's been tossed out the door. And, of course, now we, we had a soup once that was made out of Jesus, but the uh, atheists figured they could take the meat out of the soup toss the meat away and create a moral consomme. So I, I'm just saying that the, the different cultures of the earth all have very different moralities. And now even within Western civilization, we see a tremendously stark division in terms of morality. So I protest that glib tendency to look at things and automatically assume there's a morality that's all on the same page and we're all evolving to the same place. 
is that a response to something specific in this paper? Oh, yeah, I was just, just finding some, some things you're saying before, Rick. There's that, that tendency to slide into that uh, glib mo uh, moral projection that we're morally all on the same page. It's, it's, it's a reasonable assumption in terms of a small social group. You live in a small village. Nobody goes there. They're xenophobes. They have their morality. Occasionally, people differ, but they enforce their village morality, and it works. But when we try to project such a concept over the entire world, it's ridiculous. Really, it's ridiculous. And I, yeah, I, I almost take offence at this uh, glib morality, which universalist sort of idea, which has been projected. I'm just, just raising a protest. That's all. I appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Phil and then James. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I, I, in, in some ways, I hesitate to defend uh, Kenneth Smith because I sort of have some trouble with it as well. However, I will defend him in this sense, uh, based on being an artist. I, I, I think the problem that I'm finding with other com uh, comments is that they want to construct a narrative. Right, which is a linear A to B to C to D and therefore F and so forth. Uh, I, I just like the collage principle because what cubism did, mm -hmm. which was to juxtapose different things from different points of view, uh, uh, leaving space, gaps in between, I should say gaps in between so that there's a tensional relationship between these uh, various uh, viewpoints, uh, dialogues, or uh, whatever, that in a sense that you have to fill your own imagination to make the connection. And I think that, I think he does uh, a good job in making that juxtaposition as a new way, you could say, you could either say to formalize uh, the narrative or deconstruct the narrative, depending how you want to say it. Uh, so I think I think we don't pay enough at, at, uh, attention to the outside forces that penetrates into the narrative, even when the narrative is given in a linear fashion, right? We'll say that, but I think he's intermixing these things so that in a sense it opens up this space, which was in between, which is really justifiable, right? right. So you can think about uh, something like Bartok, who understands that there were many, many notes between the 12 tones, right? Microtone. Right. And why have we forgotten about those? In other words, that, so I kind of think that in that sense, I, I'm going to defend him because like it, it, it's, a, it's a way of proceeding that allows other things to happen, not merely like Kenneth Smith's opinion, and that's it. I'm right. against Kant or whatever. So I, I, I think that that's okay because it opens up. What I like about it opens up a space for me to say, you know, I, like I said, I had a little trouble when he was talking about Nietzsche because I thought it was like too, too uh, uh, elitist. But then he came around and he talked about it and then, oh, so now I understand. The, so therefore, in a sense, my mind was always in a flux position of wondering what's going on there. And then at the end, I sort of resolved the problem myself. He did not give me the answer. He did not give me the answer. And so therefore there was space for me to enter into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in that sense, I'm gonna defend him. And I, I think that's what a lot of people are complaining because well, the narrative seems suspicious. <laughs> And all this, you know, I don't know. I whether it's suspicious or whether you, you you open up other spaces. I think that's important. Thank you for that, Phil. It, it certainly goes towards his intentions with this particular paper. That the purpose isn't isn't for him to make a linear narrative argument about what he thinks about Kant. Um, he's he's got other papers about Kant, Hegel, and and the rest of these guys that he's gone into in enormous detail with with a lot of footnotes and and a lot of bibliographies. This is exactly what you're saying, Phil. This is a collage. The, the purpose of this is just to open up a discussion that crosses the usual boundaries, like. 
a lot of philosophy today, people go in and they become a Kant scholar and they know Kant and Kant is their thing, or they become a Nietzsche scholar and they know Nietzsche and Nietzsche is their thing. But you put them in a room together and they have a hard time because they each want to change the topic back to the thing that they're comfortable with. Because, you know, th there's too much kind of this, this segmentation we talked about earlier that kind of lends itself to the, 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 the kind of disembodied, disconnected from the whole. Uh, what this is doing here by making these five philosophers comment on Kant and by introducing Kant, he's trying to cross those boundaries and, and, and create a possibility for us to have a conversation about it. Uh, you know, if he, if he was trying to make a linear argument, it would look a lot more like some other papers he's written and not like this one. Uh, James, and then I think Richard's right. We'll go back to the paper. We'll talk about the Kierkegaard section after we call on James. Go ahead, so James. Is, um, is Kant, uh, you know, um, you know uh, was he defending uh, this kind of, um, you know, uh, individualism of the rational, you know, individual, to replace the church as a moral, uh, you know, arbiter uh, and moral, moral agent in, in a, in a uh, and in aligning his system with the, with science, you know, correlating with science. And that um, by, by this kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, with uh, these three faculties, of course, he was, uh, he was trying to make them coherent or, you know, uh, interrelate with one another but he had to rely on common sense and the imagination. And then finally, if it did, that didn't work, he had to, he had to bring in reason, you know, to, to make it uh, to make sense of his notions of beauty and, and, uh, and particularly, you know, when it comes to morals, you know, he had to rely on reason to posit, you know, the good over the desires and so forth. And that, um, and that by uh, you know that that this individual can decide, right? What is what is right and wrong, right? I just just the act of universalization, right? And so yeah. here you get to you know if the individual can do that, then it's just this matter of you know um, how you define it, the individual then, right? Because for him, after he makes the uh, you know makes the uh, uh, he, you know, uh, makes the universalization, it becomes a more, uh, you know, in, uh, imperative and it becomes kind of a social edict, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer just individual. Is that, is that it? So there's a, there's some interesting lines of development of the ethics in Kant um, that I, I, I don't know how, how the, the strict Kantians would feel about it, but but I, I think it does justice to Kant. One of the one of the roots I think of of what Kant's doing here is is like we talked about a, a couple of weeks ago is this idea of duty, that um, to be you know empirically responsible, to be ethically responsible, you there are certain duties upon you as an individual, things that you are required to do. I think most people who are interested in philosophy have some sense of that within themselves, that they're, they are wanting to look more deeply at these questions and they feel like they need to, that, that, that everybody should. And it's certainly part of Kant's core argument when he talks about the categorical, categorical imperative, when he, when he talks about his framework for ethics, he's, he's asserting that we have a duty to dig more deeply to be able to, to rationalize and, and, and intellectualize and systematize the basis for our decision making, whether it's whether it's empirical or, 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 or ethical. And I feel like, you know, you can trace roots of that back to Socrates' statement that the philosopher has uh, a duty to the rights of the question. When, when, it, when a, to a, a philosophical question comes up, you're not allowed as a philosopher to just mess with it however you want to reach the conclusions you want to reach ahead of time, that you have to take the question seriously. There's sort of a, there's sort of a sacred duty to really engage with what's at stake, um, you know, empirically and epistemologically with the, with the topics that come up. And Kant certainly, that, that, that duty, regardless of whether it's shared with other people, is, is also an individual duty that you as an individual philosopher, you know, need to do justice to things. And you can see how in some ways what Kant, just like Kant is, is trying to systematize some things that Descartes introduced but did sloppily, or, or let's say more naively, less, less, less developed. In the same way, he's sort of taking the Socratic theme 
of of the um, you know the the rights of the question and making that a duty of the philosopher that if you're if you're if we're living in a in a post medieval world um, in which there has been a, a collapse of the authority of the church and we need a new framework for ethics and and, and and for treating one another ethically that that doesn't fall prey to the potential nihilism of a mechanical universe or of a completely psychologized human, then it's going to be necessary to appeal to that sense of, of duty of what your responsibilities are as a, as a moral agent in the world, as a person. Um, and you can see him leaning heavily into that and and trying to to use that as part of the foundation uh, for right and wrong and for and for decision making. So this, the assumption uh, is that the um, the individual. But that doesn't uh, fully address your question, James. Yeah, and I'm the, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but it's assumption. It's assumption that the individual reason can just arrive at what you know what is good, right? And just decide what is good, and then be able to universalize and say rely on that that reason to say, okay, just. This is good, so I, I universalize it. Therefore, it becomes a, a more imperative, right? It's like let's say the question of uh, of uh, abortion, right? Um, you know, you have the pro-life, okay? Pro-life, you know, life is good, so, so therefore, um, you know, uh, it's it's the uh, the more imperative would be to uh, have anti-abortion because that means killing life. That's a that's contradictory, contradictory to to life, right? And that becomes a moral imperative, which everybody must must obey. So there's no like, there's no, um, you know, uh, back and forth with this kind of reasoning. It's just the, it's just uh, it, it's just an assumption that uh, you know, that a particular um, position you take is is going to be good, and then you universalize that, and automatically it becomes a more imperative. Is that is that how it works? Well. Just like the, uh, the question of- That's can tell me if I'm getting this right or not. I, I would think that Kant would say that that's, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just like the, uh, you know, when he says, you know, lying is always wrong, right? But it's not true. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's not, you know, sometimes lying is is is, uh, is a matter of life and death. You know, you you must lie, yeah, in order to save someone's life perhaps, right? If a Nazi's knocking on your door and you're hiding a, a, uh, a, a Jewish person or someone that the Nazis are after to um, take him to the crematorium, you know, of course you're going to lie, right, to save a person's life. Yeah, but that, that we were kind of mixing things up and we can always add another element and make the question into a trick question with another trap door. So the question about lying, the person isn't willing to lie. The person is willing to save a life. That's right. their that's what they are trying to do. How do they carry that out in the world? There's a means to carry that out. Okay. So just like if you're pro-life, right? You say, okay, I'm pro-life. Therefore, yeah, I, uh, I, any, any, uh, any act of abortion is wrong then, right? I, I think that the, like Kantian ethics, Newtonian mechanics can be abused by being ignorant. So you can't you know, in Kantian ethics, you can say, I'm following my duty. And if you're following the duty of someone who is corrupt and violent and, you know, destroying humanity and human life, this negligence is not excused because you're not assumed in Kant to be free of ignoring the facts of the world. Just like in Newton, you know, if you're planning for evil can evil to jump his Chevy over 20 buses, you know, and you know what the Chevy weighs, you know what the springs can do, okay, and you send them off with a load of bricks in the trunk that you didn't calculate for, you're ignoring the facts. You are not, you can't blame Newton for it not working. It's negligent to not know the meanings of the, the things you're using in your decision. Now, there's some things you can't know. You can't have perfect knowledge, okay? But to say life begins and to say, that's what it means to save a life, two cells, then you say, I love life and I love, you know, cells. It's not, are we talking about life, cell? You want to call that life? Your definition of life has to be subject to some kind of scrutiny. Now, if you really, you know, deal with that question unambiguously, you're a genius because that's not an unambiguous question. So I don't think, I think it's a red herring, some of these arguments. You, you know, you're not, when there's certain knowledge, that's one thing. When there's uncertain knowledge, 
just like doing physics. You can't blame the system of physics for the fact that there's difficult problems. There are difficult problems. So you're saying that, um, so, so you're saying that once you um, establish a, a categorical imperative, you can go back and, and change your mind? I'm saying some of the arguments against Kant are easily made that are disingenuous. Okay, they don't do him justice. That's all. But he's actually asking right now. So, yeah, you you've got an immersion in Kant. Go ahead. Why don't you respond? So it's what you know? How does how does Kant take this? What what would Kant say about that question about whether you're allowed to go back and reevaluate a categorical imperative? I'm not actually sure what the question means. I think Kantian ethics gives you a chance with your full knowledge of something to make a decision based on a principle that is a supreme principle and that your decision to do that, after you reflect back on it, you say, you know, with what I knew and everything I did at that point, you can never find that was not good if you made it based on a rational principle summoning all the truth that you understood in the situation, the reality of it. You can't go back and say, I was being bad. You can say, that had really sucky consequences. But, you know, how could I have known there were bricks in the car? They, they, they didn't tell me. Like, they lied to me about everything. You know, oh, you know, I pushed the button to ring the door, but it was hooked up to blow up a building. What? You know, give me a break. It's not, my decision was not in any way evil. So yeah. It's my will. The question is, my will good? Yes, my will was good. You want to talk about something else? Go back and reevaluate it. You can't change the fact that that was a good will. That was good. Uh, you, you left out the word intent. The word is intent. That's what will is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying that as long as the uh, the 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 will, the intent is is good. Therefore, whatever you do is is also good, right? It doesn't matter if the consequences. It doesn't uh, matter if uh, if you uh, someone foresees or not the, the consequences and can prevent something from happening. All right, you, you don't have you don't have to consider the con consequences of no, your 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 decision is based on all the consequences you can imagine and know, or else you're a bad physicist. No, and there are many that you can't. I mean, it's uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, but at the time. You don't really know what the consequence is, but we're not holding the philosopher um, responsible. <laughs> we're studying what the progression is. But, but is, yeah, what, this is, is what I feel. Yeah, I mean, you're, switching, you're switching the question, was the will good, to were the results good, was the action? Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a different question. How can you answer several questions with, you know, I can only, you only do one at a time. That's a bad well, thing about time. Well, it's only one. about the intent. But but isn't there a deeper problem in this sense? Like the problem is that you do not know all the possible consequences because there's always a degree at least of uncertainty. and uh, But nonetheless, you are charged when you live in the earth to make decisions. Sometimes you just can't say, well, I just can't decide. You know, it's just too complicated. But you still have to act. So what happens in that situation when you compel the act, but you don't know all the factors? But you, you know, have to act, but just you don't. But you have to consider some of the co possible consequences, as well as your intent. Right. And it seems like Kant is just ignoring the consequence, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the entertaining of uh, possible con consequences. He's just relying on the intent, the individual will, if as long as you have a good will, okay, based on your ra uh, rational understanding of um, A does not equal, A, A equals A, okay, right? Then, of course, that kind of, uh, you know, logic, Aristotelian logic <clears throat> is 100% is, uh, is, is reliable, right? I, I don't want to drag us off the paper. I mean, you know, I want to get on do, do the paper. But... Yeah, can we? No, sure. but that's that, that's you know that's uh, the the crux of what the the critique is, and you're 
And for any defenders of Kant, uh, we need to go, you know, we, uh, this is one of his, you know, most prominent um, ideas of rational, um, you know, idealism. We may, have, we may have to come back to it because this is, this is an example of something where what we'd like to do is actually have the Kant paper itself, not, not Kenneth Smith's paper, but Kant's paper in front of us to say what did Kant actually say on this topic. Uh, you know, if, if we're trying to argue about what Kant said about something as specific as did he allow for the consequences of the action or was he focused entirely on intent? We're not going to be able to resolve that from this paper that we have before us because it doesn't go into that level of detail. Right, right. Uh, so we'll, we'll, this is and another then, thing we'll have to come back to. And then we can compare the Kenneth Smith's critique to what Kant was thinking. Well, know? like, so unless Sharon we points- have, unless we have the actual Kant paper, we can't do that. Right, but what, one thing that we can address is that, um, and you know, Sharon points out that the Kierkegaard section talks about one of Kierkegaard's critiques of Kant, and that we could talk about because it's actually here. Um, it, it, we've we've got the details to work with, but but other things we may have to come back to, you know, bringing with us, you know, other other texts. Like, like Kant's text, I'd like to have in front of me before I try to argue what his position is about whether the consequences, you know, play into uh, play into the the ethics of, of of what you've talked about. So I'm going to go to Kierkegaard in a moment, but Fred and Stephen have both been waiting, so I'm going to call on them first, and then let's turn to the Kierkegaard section. Uh, Fred, go ahead. Uh, yeah, as I recall from uh, Kant's Groundworks of Metaphysics, <clears throat> he does this does address this in some. Like that, and he may, mainly does it by dodging the issue. And I think James, James's point is is uh, is well taken, even beyond understanding the, the full consequences of your actions. Uh, James poses the question. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, I'm glass. Tell me what happened. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, James uh, raises the question of whether uh, do not lie uh, satisfies the categorical imperative. And Kant's example is, um, should one uh, lie when taking out a loan uh, about, your abil- about your willingness to repay it? Should one say, yes, I will repay it, and then lie about that? And his, his conclusion was no, that the categorical imperative implies that you should not do that behavior. That was an easy one for Kant. What he does not answer and what is a weakness in Kant. Uh, you have to realize that categorical imperative is supposed to be non-contingent, necessary, universal. So what he does not consider is James' exact question, should one lie? And in that case, in order to apply a categorical imperative, you would need more information and context. In other words, you would need to factor in contingent behavior. And so to my mind, that is a weakness in Kantian ethics is that it kind of dodges some hard questions. And much as you might try to wall off contingency from necessity, the contingency of our very imperfectly understood and volatile world inevitably factor into ethical decisions. Thank you for that, Fred. That was very helpful. So uh, Stephen and then Phil, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna go from Stephen directly to the Kierkegaard section because it, it gets us something that we can really chew on here. So Stephen, go ahead. Hmm. Yeah, I did just mentioning uh, the question, you know, the moral question in relation to abortion and all that. Christianity lights again. It's the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. So there's only certain certain areas, you know, self-defense is one of them where that can be, uh, be overridden. So in the case of abortion, the only case that uh, uh, Christianity or Judeo-Christianity allows is if the life of the mother is under threat. That's the only justification for abortion. And I'd be I'd be very curious if anybody else can come up with another justification. Can we so not take the now, and, and that, the whole thing and not kill. Two minutes. I'll give you in less than a minute and a half. Actually, actually, what I, what I'm going to do is step shall, in and say 
I'm going to step in and say we could spend an entire session arguing about abortion. I'd kind of like to talk about the paper. So, okay, um, okay, okay. So, so this this is a big arbitrary Christian value: "Thou shalt not kill." I'm not saying I'm an exponent of it. I'm just saying that was the Christian value. Thank you for that, Stephen. So, if we look at the Kierkegaard section in this paper. What we, what we have here is kind of Kenneth Smith trying to sketch out very quickly what are Kierkegaard's core concerns about Kant. Um, and he, he argues that Kierkegaard is one of the philosophers who spent a great deal of time thinking about Kant and, and the consequences of Kantianism you know, in his own life. Of course, you know, for those who've read Kierkegaard, you know that the great challenge is how often he wrote obliquely about his positions by instead having different personality types role play and, and argue out the issues rather than him telling you straight up what he thinks the issues are. If, if, you read Kant, if you read Kierkegaard literally and think that in every sentence he's telling you what he thinks, you're, you're going to get totally tripped up because he likes to pit different flawed perspectives against each other as a way to talk about uh, this, this issue that Sharon raised, which is that human beings come in diverse psychological forms and modes and um, they're heavily shaped by culture. And so the, the challenge is, is everybody competent to reason out ethics for themselves the way that Kant argues we have a, a duty to do? And, and if they are not, then what happens when you say there should be no consideration for, for morality other than what you have been able to reason out yourself, but the way that you reason is, what if the way you reason is fundamentally selfish and benighted? Or what if the way that you reason, you know, is is in terms of formalisms and abstractivisms, regardless of whether they lead you to good or bad conclusions? That there's a that there's a challenge here, in that um, Kant lays out a system of ethics that works best if you have the kind of mind that gives you the purchase on the topic that you need in order to be able to reach reliable conclusions. But if that's not the kind of mind you have, uh, do we, you know, is this a good foundation for ethics? Uh, for you know, it, it, we can see that this is this is where he starts talking about um, the the difficulty of of the, the perfect universalism of, of of Kantian systems of epistemology and ethics is that it's a poor fit for human beings because human beings don't have a universal way of thinking or conceiving of the world um, or or a universal capacity to reason these arguments through. Uh, so we find ourselves in a situation where maybe what is being presented as a universal prescription for how we should reason out these issues instead turns out to be just one tool in the toolbox, something that you can use if you've been trained in that tool and you know how to use it, but that, you know, like you shouldn't let little kids have the razor blades <laughs> you know, until they understand that you can cut yourself, until they know the basics of how you use this thing safely in order to, to arrive at conclusions. Uh, so that's just, you know, as a, as, a, as a way to open up the conversation and get it going. Uh, Joseph, you got your hand up. Go ahead. No, I mean, and this is what Kierkegaard's whole idea was that you need God. We're not capable of rationalizing all of these things out. So we need to be people of faith. We need a higher ideal to be able to strive for that will allow us to then, uh, you know, make these decisions without any kind of ambiguity. And so that we full force and that takes us through the idea of any kind of fear and trembling that we're going to actually do the wrong thing. And, and so that, it, you know, that we have this faith that is the basis of all our decisions. And so that's where he kind of differs from Kant in that perspective, because Kant says, no, you can actually come to a rational decision just using your logic in this, you know, and, and, and so if somebody knocks at the door, use your logic and, you can kind of know, but the, the person of faith can answer this question. And even if they're scared in this, they're, they're still able to come through that fear and trembling and answer the question correctly. I mean, so that's my distinction is the understanding of this belief in God or a higher power that you need because the limits of human rational thinking, which is reasonable to me to say there is limits of human rational thinking. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a that's a fair characterization of of um, Kierkegaard's core critique of Kant that that um, you know reason may be necessary, but that it's not sufficient. 
and that he would like to reground ethics in the religious perspective. You can see the way that he lays out the three spectra that people develop across according to the, the Kierkegaardian schema in which at the bottom level, you've got this struggle between the immediate sense perception, immediate feeling reaction life, and the, and the more poetic life in which you shape or design yourself. So that's that, that, that layer. And then he's got this ethical layer above it in which you're trying to reason your, you, you, now that you've developed you know, the capabilities of the aesthetic personality using Kierkegaardian terminology, you should now be able to reason ethically about the world, perhaps in a Kantian sense, at least, at least partially, it seems like the ethical layer is a is a is a, a partly Kantian layer. But then he posits that that's there are things that that can't resolve, and that you need this religious layer above it as the as the level that the personality is supposed to de develop into if you're going to become a fully actualized human being. Um, which, which even allows you to, to he even addresses the lie of omission with you know when he's talking about the story of Abraham with. Uh, with Eliza. So the idea that he's going to lie is, you know, it's okay because you're doing it for the higher ideal. So it kind of answers the same question that if somebody knocks at your door, what do you do? Right. So. Right. Um, James, you got your hand up and then Phil. Yeah. So this uh, concept, practical reason, right, is supposed to provide uh, the, uh, the individual, right, with, um, you know, ensures his freedom, right? And that kind of reasoning, you know, ability to reason morally uh, assures that he is free. And in the, uh, in our, you know, um, you know, modern um, technology with artificial intelligence, you could, if it's, if it's rational, right? And, and Kant saw the limits of, uh, you know, reason also, but we, you know, we, we have enough, um, you know, understanding of, uh, you know, technology and artificial intelligence and algorithms to actually, you know, probably uh, build a Kantian, you know, AI, right? With all these, uh, with, with this, you know, uh, you know this, this system of reason. And if that's the case, then this AI could, you know, uh, you know, um, actually uh, perform this kind of ration, uh, rational, rational, uh, uh, you know, re, um, you know, um, activity to to make more decisions and so forth. So, does that make the make the AI free? Is the AI a free agent then, if if he can do that, just because he's able to morally reason and 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 establish a um, categorical categorical imperative? You understand humans? What what what's that? Go ahead, so David. Another that that's a way, you know, Kant is, you know, kind of defining what a human being is. A, a, a free human being is a rational being. So we can also replicate that in, uh, in AI uh, pretty much, right? Your responsibility to human beings is about there being also non-rational too. It's mm -hmm. about the whole human being. And yeah, the, expand you know, on that, David. This is good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You respect the rational and you care for the happiness of the other, which has to do with their sensibilities. Do computers understand what it means to feel and live and think and care in the future? I guess they can understand planning the future. Do they understand care? You have to take into account the one you're confronting so that you can make a universal principle based on everything that the fact that they are capable of rationality too has to be taken into that equation. You're allowed to hurt someone? That doesn't make sense. It has to, you know, it involves understanding the real world. It just says use the facts of the real world to make a decision. I'm not sure humans uh, expect computers to understand human being for a long time. If they do, then maybe they can be free. They interact with humans. Yeah, computers sort of have the you know, c computers. This is what I do for my living. <laughs> Is I write medical software, so you know it's 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 a it's a problem for computers that everything that they know about the real world has been abstracted from it. All the data, all the metadata, all the properties, all the data structures that they create are are abstractions of what's real rather than what's concretely real. And this goes to David S's point, I think that that the, the challenge for a computer of trying to implement Kantianism ethics is that they have no direct concrete experience of the world or other people, or even of themselves. 
um, they only have these abstracted symbolic representations, you know, text, numbers, you know, dates, what have you, which as we all know, are, you know, they may stand in for the thing, but they're not the thing itself. And so then the question becomes, you know, could they do justice to what Kant says is, is are the responsibilities of someone who's engaging in, in, in ethical determination? I think David is, is, is right that, that uh, Kant would say no, not, not unless computers get to the point where they can collect you know, meaningful, substantive, concrete experience about the world, would they be in a position to be able to reason in a Kantian way? But is it Kantian the emotional, is it Kantian, sorry. Is it Kantian rationalism a form of uh, abstraction? When, when, uh, when Kant's rationalism, uh, uh, you know, posits the, you know, the good and uh, as the highest, you know, um, form of desire, isn't that, isn't that kind of uh, abstractionism? I mean, what, you know, Kant gets gets characterized as being kind of the most perfectly abstracted, intellectualized uh, philosopher. But the truth is, I think that he is a hybrid, right? He is still taking into account uh, the real world to some extent. And you see that with the idea of duty. You know, the idea that we have a duty uh, to, 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 to pursue the truth and to pursue ethics is, a, is not a purely abstract intellectualized idea. And it's an important idea. I'm glad it's in there. I'm glad it's part of, of Kantianism. It, it's an example of something that um, someone engaging in Kantian reasoning about ethics and, and what's true could, could, could take into account and, and use, but something that is say a computer really would, be, would struggle to take into account or use because it has no real sense of duty. It also so, doesn't have any emotional capacity, which is very, you know, is part of integral to the human experience. That, that's what's so pleasing about Marvin, the paranoid android. You finally see what it would mean to have a creature that had empathy, you know, with it, but it's overwhelmed by its own feelings. So it would have to understand it's confronting other entities with paranoia, with fears and, and you know, irrational things that affect the way they breathe and feel in their muscles and body and treat them in the proper way. Uh, when a computer can do that, it's ready. Well, computers have no will, do they? Does a computer have a will? You know, is, well, is that a good question? But then you'd have to go back to parenting. So you have to parent a computer. <laughs> In the same healthy way that uh, that brings emotional health, <laughs> so well, it's just, the same uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, I was just pointing out that in Kant, the prominent uh, you know idea is is the ra uh, is the rational part. It predominates, you yes. Know, whereas uh, you know Heidegger's uh, you know what became a, a, a expert on Kant, and he developed his philosophy based on on the ideas of care and concern. And uh, being, you know, immersed in the world of of, uh, of, ex of experience, whereas Kant is is coming out of this uh, world, kind of like a monad of rational concepts and and ideas, and interpreting the sensibility, the sensible world, with these con concepts. It, it doesn't. It admits that it doesn't even know what the world it really is. It doesn't know the in itself, the, the you know num numina. But when it gets a practical reason the transcendental self becomes part of the noumena, right? Uh, 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 it becomes a super sens sensible, you know, right? As was well Kant, wasn't Kant merely an eccentric living in the fairy tale kingdom of uh, mad Frederick's Prussia? No. Uh, that's he me. Wasn't. I'm just uh, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, go ahead. You've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Let me say whether you uh, you put reason and rationalism atop of, of, of some kind of divine being that's even beyond that. The problem is that other cultures have other divine beings. Yeah, that's the point. So, 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 the, so the problem there is that while you might be totally comfortable that you have made the right choice because your divine God has justify all, all your reason have justified it 
Uh, the most you could say about the Enlightenment in that particular sense is that these other beings that have other gods and have other forms of reasoning are a kind of inferior form of human beings. And maybe you could say, well, let's be patient and they will eventually become like us, right? Which means that I could see how in the 18th century and into the 19th century that racism and like the destruction of American Indians or the conversion of, of the South American Indians and uh, the conversion of the world becomes such a mandate because, because you have, in a sense, the most arrived at, maybe not the most perfect, but the most arrived at situation, we have now learned to at least project a degree of respect, even to the people living in New Guinea, <laughs> right? That they have their culture. And maybe you could say, let's be patient and they'll you know, be whatever. Or maybe you could say, eventually when we start shipping goods to them and they'll see the good life, they abandon their old ways and come to our way. But what I'm saying is that it seems to me the respect has to go beyond your particular values, at least to a certain degree, without drawing this sort of division about like a kind of hierarchy of arrival, of awakening. So I, I, I see a potential problem with that. I mean, I'm not totally adverse to that idea, but I do see a problem because you're still kind of judging others based on your criteria. And I'm not entirely sure if those criteria are the most enlightened ones, to tell you the truth. Wow, that's a uh, full of full of potent stuff there, Phil. That is a lot a lot to chew on. Uh, Sharon, you got your hand up. I agree with Phil 100%. And in, 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 in making ethical decisions, I think Kant's philosophy is just the start, but it's, it's got so many pitfalls that it's got to be counterbalanced by another philosophical idea. And usually it's utilitarianism. But some of the points that you just raised fail. Yeah, there's, there's, there's this interesting kind of criticism that one can make of things that are necessary but not sufficient. That's good. And things that are necessary but not sufficient are things you really want people to develop, you really want them to invest in and to do, but you don't want them to think that they're done when they've done that thing, that, that, that now they have all the tools that they need. The, the, where we get into danger is, is the man with the hammer fallacy. If we start to think that one faculty is enough and the other faculties must be vestigial and there for no reason, and evolution made a mistake by giving them to us at all, and we should only do this one thing and everything should be expressed in those terms. That's where we start to get into trouble. And in evaluating to what extent did Kant intend that and to what extent did other people mistake Kant Mm -hmm. And say that he meant that, and 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 claim that he did, and then and then and then laud Kant for the thing that he never told them to do in the first place because he wanted something more nuanced. You know, these things to tangle these out, we actually have to look at Kant directly. Uh, it, it, but you know, where Kierkegaard is coming at Kant is when he's saying that not everybody's fit to do Kantian ethics. Right. Most people aren't actually at that level of, of, of cognitive development. Most people are still caught up in, I want what I want. And if you get in my way, you're a bad person. Or I just want to, this life's too hard. I just want to follow the rules. I want to do what the system tells me to do. And if you try to make me think about other things than that, I'm, I'm not going to be happy with you. It's like an enormous numbers of people are caught up in these cycles of thinking. And, and I think Kant would certainly agree that neither mode of thought is adequate to do Kantian ethics or Kantian epistemology. That he would, he would say they need to rise up from that level in order to be competent to do the thing that he's telling them to do. Where, where, where it becomes different is that Kierkegaard is saying that may be true, but we still need a system of ethics that's capable of handling people as they actually are. Because if our ethics only work if people develop to a certain point, then we're stuck in, an, in, a, in a mode of existence in which we can't apply our ethical system because too many people can't actually do it. You, 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 
you left that important statement slightly short. Yeah, please. I do I want what I want, but I want it when I want it. I want what I want. When yes. I want. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's an important part. <laughs> yes. The, the impatient desire driven thing. But yeah, it, it seems it seems like, you know, th this is Kierkegaard's critique of Kant is is not that not that what Kant's describing is, is something nobody should do, but rather that it's something that many people can't do. And that Kierkegaard might not agree with Kant that it's the highest form of reasoning. He might say, like, like, like Joseph said earlier, that God and, and a religious approach is higher because he's he's a Christian and he's he's a Christian philosopher specifically. But certainly he's acknowledging that there is a level of, of epistemological and ethical reasoning that can be done at the Kantian level. He just doesn't think it's that everybody can do it or that it's as far as we can go. David S. and then James. Go ahead, David. Oh, yeah, I was just answering on the chat thing there. Um, yeah, with the Kierkegaardian response, it's sort of interesting. He, um, I'm not, I wasn't really, even by Kierkegaard himself with his own argument, but uh, the, even the summary here, convinced that, you know, we're talking about Abraham and whether he's failing and whether a person can overcome the their human tendency to be embedded in a civilization, to work within the norms of that civilization. Aren't they in a box? How, you know, how could they ever get out of that? Because they're begin, being given all these verbal duties. And I think Kant says, yeah, those are just evidence in your system. You have to rationalize and see which of them is credible based on a principle. Which one has a principle? Because um, Abraham goes up maybe intending to sacrifice Isaac, but in the end, he can't do it because there would be something really wrong with his story. So did he need to go through all that going up there to do it, he needed that kind of Kierkegaardian faith or did he need to go up there and decide how he's gonna execute a sacrifice? You know, maybe without killing his son. Uh, however he did it, he broke out of, he was doing it because that's at the time what you did. You took your firstborn when you were, you know, ready to make your ultimate sacrifice to your deity and you killed your firstborn. He was, he was showing that he was living for the purpose of God in the world. Could he work his way out of the box? He might have done it a little sooner and maybe saved his life, the life of his wife, because by the time she comes, he comes back, she never, he, they never speak again. She dies. She, the next thing you hear, she's dead. Uh, yeah, he killed her basically by like putting her through that. He could have done better, you know? So I think the Kantian framework fits really well into there, but Kierkegaard's sucking the matter out. Maybe it wasn't so easy. And, and I respect that examination of that, but the Kantian choice was made. You don't sacrifice a life for the symbolic representation of your dedication to the ultimate values. And something is still wrong if you're killing your kid for that. <laughs> I, think, I think most of us on this call would agree with you 100% about that, David. <laughs> It's a hairline difference. He stood up in front of everyone and he was about to do what they were saying he should do, you know, and he didn't. So Kierkegaard, he stepped out of the box. I don't know how he did it, but somehow rationally, we think it should have been obvious. And I agree, Kierkegaard, it wasn't. It was a pure stress. But if it wasn't based on the rationality, it was based on something too weird because and I know Kierkegaard makes an incredible dilemma out of it. It'll be like my mind is blown trying to remember how twisted it is, like Inception, you know, the movie. Um, but uh, I think that when you're doing, you're saying, okay, look, I give up on Kant. It's too much thinking. People aren't going to think. So let's give them the rules. You're going to make those rules with the Kantian ethic. Yeah, you say you got to save lives. Like, that's the man. I, do I save it every time? Oh, no, there's a trolley coming. What do I do? You know, so uh, yeah, you save every time, except if they're coming to kill you, and except if this, and except if that. And, you know, so, but you're going to be reasoning it out how based on a moral principle, which is what? The universal, which is. I gave you the metaphysics, not the answers. I gave you the form of the rule, not the rule. It's your job to live. I can only tell you the form. So, you know, I hear I'm apologizing for Kant again. That's it. 
That's quite all right. It's making for a vigorous discussion. Thank you, David. James, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, it seems like there's so many other ways that you can make a more decision. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you bring it down back down to earth and, uh, you know, the uh, there are, you know, um, Eastern, um, you know, um, forms of ethics, you know, based on like uh, Confucianism, right? Based on the family, your care for your family can be a basis, a principle, right? Can be a principle or a basis for making a moral decision, right? It's based on how you care for your parents, you can extend it to other people, right? And so there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot more than just um, having to, you know, aspire to this kind of rational system of ethics. I mean, we don't have to just totally discount it, but it, we can consider it, but it seems like it, there's a lot of flaws there, you know, and um, that, I think that's what we're kind of uh, trying to understand. Yeah, there is this there is this challenge that Kierkegaard is posing here where he says, you know, are we allowed to take people as we posit them, where we are positing them in a way that is convenient for our for our intellectual schema? Or do we have to take them as they actually are, even if that's inconvenient for our schema? It's like what there is a question here of priority that's being evaluated about the relationship of how things actually are to how we envisioned them. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of the perfect or perfectible intellect that's capable of reasoning all these things out correctly is a model for a human being. But then Kierkegaard is giving us this whole schema of other models of human beings. And he's laying them out as a developmental process in a sort of Hegelian fashion in which, you know, the people struggle against the limitations of the, of the mindset they find themselves in. And that's what drives the development of their new mindset uh, to as far as they're willing to take it, you know, up through these, up through these, this ladder that, that, uh, that Kierkegaard gives us. And so I, you know, the challenge that he poses for us is, can we come up with an ethical schema that works for all these diverse mentalities, not just for one of them, that, that happens to be a good fit for our initial theory. And his, his argument is that um, the Kantian ethical system only works for some of them and not for others because others just don't tick that way. They won't reach, Kant himself would watch them trying to reach conclusions, would shake his head going, you're not doing it right. But you know, until they evolve to that level, they can't do it right. They're, they're at a different level in development. It's like when we'd want an infant you know, to not put their hand on the hot stove, we don't go about it the same way we do when we're telling another adult, watch out, that's hot. You know, we can, we can, you can tell an adult who's burnt themselves, watch out, that's hot. And their first reaction will not be to go hot. Hot sounds nice. I'll touch that. You know, it's like, they know what you mean. They have the context. They have the framework. They're ready to process the information. But, you know, ooh, pretty is unfortunately a reaction that, that many very, very small children have to fire. <laughs> it's like, it glows, it's warm. Of course I wanna touch it. Uh, you know, it's like, how do you frame an ethical schema such that it can handle these diverse mentalities? Um, and of course, then you have Kierkegaard positing that there's something beyond reason, that there's this religious level that is, that is deeper and further, further developed than, than even the intellectualized reasoning approach. Yeah, well, Rick, your, your example, which is a good example, but you notice we have to infantilize the image of the one who can't understand categories of things and make distinctions between danger and pretty, right? So we, we are, in a sense, taking the cultural superiority, you know, the cultural centric view which is a matter of, okay, what are you ready to handle? I mean, Newtonian physics is true, but you can barely add. I guess we can't multiply and do forces and stuff, but we can do some things. You can balance weights, you know, okay. So we'll give you that job. We can't expect you to, but that means, what does that mean sociologically? Uh, these people aren't ready to maybe handle guns, uh, you know, okay, well, well, you live in this, you know, like maybe you should limit your uh, activities a certain way. Huh, huh, what? You know, where are we going with this? But still, I think the framework of what you're deciding, you're going to use 
a rationality of an encompassing rational scheme of reality, which Kant is saying, yeah, you're doing the universalizing work for someone who can't multiply, they can only add. But the scheme is still the rational scheme. Yeah, the question of infantilization is important. It comes up here because, you know, the the the, the context that this group's been going through is we've been going through this this draft book, Mythos and Logos, that's being written. We've sort of taken a excursion to the side to talk about this Kant paper because we we were lucky enough to get Kenneth to come out of his cave and and actually do some some uh, a presentation for us uh, uh, earlier in the month. Um, so. You know, yeah. one of the things that he does in Mythos and Logos is the very first paper in Mythos and Logos starts with the position of the infant and says, you know, there's things to learn about the infant. The, the infant is not just an inferior version of an adult. Rather, the infant is where all adults come from. And that everything we value about the adult perspective grows out of the infant's perspective whether as a further extension or, 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 or elaboration of it, or as, as Hegel argues, in opposition to it. You know, you, you get to the point where you're frustrated with your limitations as an infant and you begin to abstract, you begin to reason and, 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 and predict the future and, and start to say, wow, okay, I really want that toy, but now it's behind mom's back, so it doesn't exist anymore. So I just turn away. No, I think it might still be there. You know, the development of object permanence which, which every, every one of us has gone through is a, is a, you know, it is an act of abstraction and in, in intellectualization. It's a, it's a development of that capacity that we're born with, but that we aren't initially exercising, but that we do in frustration, in opposition to, you know, the limitations that we start with. So, so you don't have to infantilize in order to talk about diversity between people, but we do have to acknowledge that we all in fact begin as infants and that there is this course of development that we go through and that any one of us at any given point is neither at the, at the point where we're philosophizing. None of us is either at the beginning or at the end of that process of development. And so there's a huge variety uh, among people of their capacity to do different things and whether you can form a schema uh, of, of deciding right and wrong or, or true or false um, from where you're at using the tools um, of, of one particular model of mind. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call on Jyoti and then Phil. Um, this whole idea of infantilizing, again, puts a kind of hierarchy over things. But the thing is that if, depending on your perspective, actually an infant knows everything. An infant doesn't have any somatic restrictions, um, doesn't have any trauma, it, it can move, you know, its body however it wants versus the, as you get older and older, you start getting, you know, fascial trauma and you can't move the way, you know, you want to. So it's so much a matter of context and perspective. And, um, but if, you know, if you want to go down to rationalization, you have to use some set of criteria. And uh, the question is, who sets the criteria? <laughs> you know, like that that's basically seems to be at the heart of um, uh, this discussion between Kenneth Smith and almost like a discussion between all five of these philosophers is, where who gets to set the criteria yeah how and, do you decide yeah how do you decide and then you know when he comes into capitalism there's there's a movement in society as a, that's uh that, that keeps changing it's not static so even if you choose So it keeps changing, you know, like if you do Marx, yeah, everybody's equal. However, it didn't turn out that way. And the results were completely different. Um, and if you want to go to um, Kierkegaard, was it Kierkegaard or Kant who said that, you know, each person decides, but uh, you don't know 
how much capacity they have to decide. So Kierkegaard is arguing people Kierkegaard, have different capacity. Yeah, so people have different capacity, but who determines the capacity? So again, we're left in a vacuum. <laughs> and, yeah, well, and where it gets really interesting with, with Kierkegaard as with Hegel is that is that they are both arguing that like like what you said, the infant is not inferior to the adult. Uh, it's a it's it's not that an infant is merely an empty cup that hasn't yet been filled with adulthood. It rather that, as Hegel argues, the infant is a live wire who's completely connected to their feelings and to their their sensations. They're, they don't they haven't yet developed the abstractivizing mind, or at least maybe some of it developed for nine months in the womb, but they haven't gotten very far. They're still about as far as we're ever going to be plugged into just direct experience without a whole lot of intellectual interpretation. But there's and, no, no empathy there. They don't understand that when they smack you, that hurts. Even if you go, ow, I, I'm really, it was today. Right. My, right. my grandma had no idea. So, so there's some positives and negatives, you know, is yes. what I'm trying to say. That uh, it's not a hierarchy of, oh, okay, as you get that's, older, you that's get wiser. Hegel's argument. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're, you're giving Hegel's argument here. Hegel says that as we intellectualize, as we get more involved in abstractivizing, um, and systematizing our modes of thought, like you're saying, just just like at a physical level, our fascia and uh, you know various adhesions get us stuck so that we can't do certain movements as an adult that we were able to do as a kid. In the same way, our thinking gets stereotyped because it starts to think that you're only allowed to conclude things that follow the rules of thought, and and it also starts to focus more on the power of abstracting so that you can predict the future, which causes it to disengage more than you did as an infant from the direct experience of life. And you can get people who are able to think very rationally and clearly and systematically and yet draw false conclusions. They're valid conclusions, they're just false because they're so lost into their system of thinking that they're not paying enough attention anymore to the actual concrete details of the world in the way that as an infant, you didn't have any choice but to pay attention to the concrete details of the world because we hadn't developed that, that mode of thought that we're going to escape into later as adults. And so this is why Hegel's argument is neither of these is better. Like you mm -hmm. say, each one has its strengths and each one has its weaknesses. But if as an adult, we come to identify overly with the intellectualized side, we may come to imagine that the infant's perspective is inferior to our own. We, we will we'll emphasize all the things that they do wrong that we do better. And we'll try not to talk about the things that they do better that we do worse because we're, we're, yeah. we're trying, we're basically trying to pat ourselves on the head and say, you know, we've, we've arrived. <laughs> Everyone should be like us, we're great, right? But Hegel's argument is no, you know, our challenge as human beings is that we have to reconcile these two modes, the original mode that we were born into, the second mode that we've grown towards as adults in order to function in the world. And then somehow we have to bring them back together into this new third mode, Vernunft, uh, which, which tries to bring together. Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I, I just want you to oh, um, kind of hear um, the word inferior. I don't think right. most, of, most people think a baby, a child, infant is inferior in any way from adults. Um, I never of, thought that about my child. For, <laughs> that actually, long, they were, they they were a lot the more. Uh, huh? <laughs> that were, they were, they're a lot more superior than us. And as they age, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's more and more you learn. I mean, from of their the point of view, yeah. if you're actually listening, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, whoa, I didn't even think of it that way. One of the memories I have of my child when he was one month old. Yes. He, he, we went on a doctor's appointment and I was holding him. And at one point I looked down and I go, hmm. And then he's, his face went, hmm. I mean, he, he made this expression that it made exact same expression. The, the expression muscle change that that he saw me do and he responded and I thought he's only one month old and he related with me you know at, at one one month old I thought that was just so amazing mm -hmm. um anyway yeah they're born full of things What's that? may I just add one more example uh Rick uh, sure, Sharon's no. so um when my daughter was nine months old and this speaks to rationalization and experience. 
So I take her to the, to, um, you know, her pediatric visit, her, uh, doctor, her pediatrician is like, I don't know, one of the professors of the professors of professors uh, in Portland, Oregon, very highly regarded. We come there, he looks at her, she's laughing, she's interacting with him perfectly. And then he starts measuring and he puts her on the curve and he's like, hmm, she hasn't gained weight and blah, 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 blah. You need to stop breastfeeding. You need to blah, 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 blah. Tomorrow you need to this because mm-hmm. she's not falling on the curve. And if she's not in a month, then she has cystic fibrosis. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Five minutes ago, you had the experience and you were like, oh, what a beautiful, healthy child. And, you know, just and then you put it all in in rational thought on lines and paper and charts. And all of a sudden she has cystic fibrosis. Like, what the, what is this? So, and, you know, and, there the balance is completely lost. And in fact, in actuality, did it turn out they have cystic fibrosis? Right. So it was their metrics that were. No. Telling yeah. Right? The metrics were completely wrong because the metrics are based on uh, Caucasian babies. And I right. took her. I took her to another pediatrician who happened to be his resident. And you know what she told me? She said, oh, he does that to every uh, brown child. And you'll see in, uh, you know, when she's uh, 18 months old, she'll be right on the curve. She's yeah. like a ballerina, you know, 13 years old, happy as a pea. So. It's like the experience of actually seeing her, holding her, right. seeing, seeing the laughing was completely, you know, disregarded versus what the, the curve looked like. Right. So there you have a complete imbalance. Of- yeah, that's, that's an example of the over-intellectualization. When they, they had all the evidence, they'd processed the evidence, they... They loved what they saw with the evidence, but then they turned away from it to their rationalized schema. And at that point, threw out all the evidence that didn't fit what the rationalized schema told them to conclude. You know, it's it's like a it's like a modern form of scholasticism. You know, they they you know the, the system tells them this is the answer they need to get, and they will you know include or exclude whatever actual concrete evidence is required to reach the the foreordained conclusion, as you will. So it's a hazard, right? Uh, Phil, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it, it's not only who sets a criteria, but who executes it that's a problem. And I'll, I'll show this dual problem in this sense. You know, like what gave us the intellectual grounding for taking the land away from the American Indians was, yes, they live on the land. They, they travel in the land, but they never worked it. So this came from a kind of Protestant, especially not even a Catholic Protestant ethic of work is what gives you virtue and and, and interaction with the world. And so therefore, since they were living in the essentially east of Eden, (laughs) then that land is free because they moved through it, they worked, they never worked it and never, they never had property. So this was, uh, this was based on the philosophy of John Locke, who should be a hero, but not, nonetheless, that, that was at least one mistake he made in terms of another culture. But beyond that, okay, let, let's say that was justified. I'm not saying it is, but let's say that's justified. Well, okay, the, uh, the, what, the, the Cherokee Indians assimilated to the American culture as best they could. They own property. Uh, they uh, work the land. <laughs> they exchange goods. Okay, they were a marketing culture. Uh, they even own slaves. <laughs> okay, that much. How much they want to be like the whites and assimilate. Okay, and so there was a thing. Uh, you know, they they moved from Pennsylvania, then forced down to uh, the Carolinas, and then. Obviously, the land became valuable, and one of some white settler wanted that. And of course, there was a uprising in a way to take the land away. And Andrew Jackson uh, decided he would do so. And of course, the uh, Cherokees know about laws, <laughs> the criteria. They sue, and the 
U.S. Supreme Court actually said, no, you don't have a right to take this land away because you've already moved them and they have a treaty, <laughs> right? They have a treaty with us. So the, the American court, the Supreme Court actually ruled against the people who complain. And Andrew Jackson basically said, okay, they, they interpret the law, let them execute it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so he took the Cherokee and executed the non-law. So power in that sense, it is power that bears down yes. <laughs> on others, yes. right? It's not even the laws, it's the power that bears down. You, you might first ask yourself, who is bearing down? <laughs> right. And you're going to have an answer, right? And so, like, in spite of the law, which was unjustified to begin with, <laughs> they still lost because power moved them. And, of course, many, many of them die. And these days, if you go to a Cherokee reservation and try to buy something with a Andrew Jackson $20 bill, they won't accept it. <laughs> yeah. They have a they have a memory, yeah. so it's power that finally comes to the conclusion. Yeah, the the trail of tears. Yes, that that's. Uh... And on that note, we've uh, we're at the end of our three hours. It's been a stimulating discussion, and as <laughs> usual, very far ranging. Uh, you know, it's it's part of what's interesting is the is the way that these philosophers bring up issues in such a way that it just, it provokes us. And we see the connections between these things and, and other issues in our lives and our history. And, uh, I'd still like to, to uh, cover uh, Nietzsche and uh, Kafka. I agree. Should we come back next week and, and do uh, Nietzsche and Kafka and their, uh, their takes on this? Yes, yes. yes please. That's good. Let's do that. And then, and then likewise, uh, you know, if we want to do more Kant reading in, in preparation, uh, finish you know, your part too. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Let's do that. That's our plan for next week. Thank you. Thank we, you, everybody. Thank you, Rick. Have Thanks, we, guys. Have we changed the name? Because last week I didn't attend because the announcement was <laughs> at 4 a.m. <laughs> so I didn't see the announcement. <laughs> yeah, we'll ha we'll have the announcement out again today or tomorrow, and we'll we'll have the name right. Well, we'll, 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 it would we missed be, you. We missed you. Contra Con, right? Uh, it wouldn't contra be Con. It. Okay, it'll be Contra Con. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Everyone have a great week. You Thanks too. a lot, everybody.